Good evening, folks, and welcome to Alien Addict on a fine and fiery evening. And it is a fiery evening tonight because we have none other than Mike Rogers in the house. Uh, I kind of didn't know if it was going to happen because he got cancelled last week. Um, and I was poorly last week as well. And Mike had stuff to do. Today, my son, I thought he'd broke his arm. So I was going to cancel the show. Turns out he hasn't. He's just a hypochondriac. No, he did have a like really big swelling, but he's, he's cool. But without further ado, enough muffling on. Let me take a quick little sip of this. I'm quite nervous tonight. Let's bring on Lee. Welcome hey, to the buddy. show, my lad. I'm, Thanks for inviting me on again. I'm very jealous of your beard. Well, that's because you haven't got one at the minute, mate. I know it's coming. It's coming back slowly. It's so itchy right now. Is it? I've... Speak. Speaking of itchy, itchy Richie. <laughs> You're muted, mate. There we still muted. Still muted. Hey, there we go. He's here. In the I didn't house. even do that. You didn't. Uh, thank you, you for didn't. having me here. It's going to be great. I'm sorry yeah. to hear about your son. Hope he's okay. But I, oh, real quick, I broke my arm in the sixth grade. And my parents didn't think it was broken. And some kid pulled on my arm to sit down in class and broke it even more. They had to call child services on my parents because they didn't take me to the hospital when I said something's wrong with my arm. Did you take him to the doctor? <laughs> oh, my word. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, enough of broken limbs. You didn't take him to the doctor? I, no, my wife did. I, oh, I good. Nearly, okay, I, okay. I, I nearly cancelled the show. He got an x-ray and everything. But without further ado, he doesn't have, an, he doesn't have a, ca uh, a camera because his son stole it. That's what, huh. that's what, that, but that's what, son, uh, that's what kids do. Kids just take. Mike Rogers, welcome to Alien Addict, my friend. How do you do? I should have been on camera, but I, I can't find mine. <laughs> so I've got an excuse. I can't find my camera either. <laughs> it right. happens. Yeah. You, you're yeah. here. Your audio's great. Um, we finally managed to get in touch from the multiple messages sent back and forth yeah. between, between my good mate, uh, Dave Miller, uh, yeah. fr from the Basin Files. People go check out the Basin Files. Dave's a great guy, and uh, he's helped me out a lot here. Um, he's the one that actually uh, asked me to do your show. Yeah, de de I, I asked Dave why he does this, and he just said, because I believe in you. So, I mean, respect yeah. him. What a nice bloke. Um, and I am going to put his link in the description, people, as well. Yeah. But, Mike, uh, for the first time, you saw... Um, you saw. I'm going to start... I'm going to start quite deep here. You've just watched the show literally probably a couple of hours ago mm -hmm. with Steve Pierce. Right. What, what did you think to that? Well, I think a lot of things. <laughs> one of the worst things, one of the things I want to address here is uh, the stuff that Ryan Gordon uh, has said. And you put a, a photo up on your page there that uh, a picture of uh, – Gentry, Gentry Lookout Tower at night when they've got the lights on, but it's an aerial view. You can tell that it's several hundred feet in the air. And uh, I can tell you right now, yeah, okay. So you I'm... can see it. So you can see it from 500 feet in the air if you're actually at the site. That is not what we're talking about. You can't see Gentry Tower. It is not visible at all anywhere within, say, 50 feet of the ground. You know, if you're on the site, anywhere on the site, even even on the ridge, the highest ridge right there, you can't see it at night or daytime or anytime. And it's four miles away, almost four miles away. I have to say, Mike, that so um, Scott, um, oh, why Scott's name gone straight out of my head, my good friend Scott. Scott um, from Eric Luke's, he comes on the show, Rich. What's Scott's name? Scott. Yeah. Scott Brown. Scott Brown, why does yeah, his Brown. name do? Scott, amazing at Photoshop. He, so this is a, I believe this is a day shot. And Scott Brown put this into Photoshop to light it up to try and get an impression 
of what it would look like at night. So I don't think this is a night shot. This is a day shot that Scott Brown has done yeah. an amazing Photoshop job on. Well, regardless, uh, even if even if it's exactly accurate, it still uh, makes my point. You can't see it, and the Gentry Tower is like 80 feet tall, and uh, you can't see any part of it from from the site. Not not even if you were above above the trees by 20 or 30 feet, you still couldn't see Gentry Tower. At night or any other time. I remember, um, I remember being on this show when um, the the director guy uh, brought Ryan. Brought, you brought, uh, brought this sort of theory up, and I think I said to him at the time, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be br brutally honest, I didn't particularly enjoy speaking to that guy. I didn't particularly like him, um, and the first thing I thought when he was talking about this was, if you guys are up there working like day in day out in that environment. I'm sure you must come come across these towers all the time. You know, I, I, it, surely it wouldn't be a it wouldn't yeah. be a yeah, it wouldn't be a surprise to you to see something like that. Yeah, they're all across the Mogollon Rim uh, because that's the way they used to detect fires was off those towers. Now they do it by radio, uh, radar, and I mean uh, by a satellite and whatever else. And they Drones, still use yeah. them, I guess, in certain places. And uh, there are a number of questions that you were talking to Steve about that uh, I wanted to. I was hoping I would be on the. I was hoping at the time when I was listening that I would be on the show. Uh, With Steve at, at the time, Steve Pierce. Well, because, you could have uh, been. Well, I I didn't know about it yet. Oh. Like I said, you know, Dave was the one that told me about it, and we talked about it, and I told him, sure. When <laughs> it went from there, you know, I'm I just saying. See that I, I can see a second show coming. <laughs> Yeah, Steve Pierce, uh, and, and when you were talking about Gentry Tower, there were so many questions there that I wish I could have answered right at the time. Because uh, so much of what Ryan Gordon has put forward there is just contrary to logic. It's contrary to reality. Just like what I just said about the photograph that you have there. Uh, from that position, 500 feet or whatever in the air at night, you might be able to see it. They probably enhanced the light to where the light is a little bit brighter, but but uh, what's the point? I mean, I don't understand Ryan's point in, in uh, saying that you can see it 500 feet in the air at night. What does that have to do with anything? Hmm. Because with so, all due respect, Mike, Ryan does believe that's the UFO because he saw that himself. Yeah, I, well, I, there's I, a I was whole the, lot of problems. Was... There's all kinds of problems wrong with his theory. Not just the fact that it can't be seen from the actual site. Uh, Steve was the one that said a couple of things like uh, the movement. And you kept saying vibrating. It wasn't vibrating. That's the wrong term. It, he, he was saying to himself, it, it was uh, moving. It was swaying back and forth. And it, was move, it turned a little bit. You know, it, it did a kind of an erratic sort of a thing as it was winding up. And uh, Gentry Tower is absolutely solid. Another thing oh, is, yeah. uh, it doesn't make any noise. <laughs> Everybody there at, at the at the UFO site, even Travis, attests to the same thing that it, it made a particular noise. There's nobody can describe it exactly. Several people describe it as it starts out as a beeping sound, and then it gets different from there. It changes, but nobody can explain it. But uh, Gentry Tower doesn't make any sound. It certainly doesn't make any UFO type sound. It doesn't move. And another thing Steve said is it took off. How can you explain the fact that it took off? Well, Steve and John and I don't know who else and myself all saw it take off. Gentry See, Tower doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> but you you saw it down the road, right? When the, when Mike took off. I mean, um, Mike, Mike well, took yeah, off. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. When they drove away. And, I was the driver. And then stopped. Isn't that where you guys saw it take off? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we're down the road, not quite a quarter of a mile, like close to an eighth of a mile, really. Uh -huh. A few, two or three hundred yards. And uh, so I stopped the truck because I was thinking, you know, what in the door? Why are we running away? We don't even know what we're running away from. You know, these things are going through my head as I'm driving away from the, the site. And we left Travis back there. It didn't seem like a very brave thing to do. So, you know, I stopped the truck and the guys in the truck are kind of confused. And some of them are yelling at me, you know, why, do, why, am, I, why am I doing stopping the truck? 
uh, other people were saying, you know, agreeing with it that we should stop the truck, and, and we got out of the truck. In fact, we all got out of the truck, uh, all of us, and uh, uh, somewhere along there as we were getting out of the truck, uh, we looked back that direction because it caught our attention. And the, le the, the thing, whatever it was, it, you know, you're looking through a, an eighth of a quarter of a mile of pretty heavily wooded area, and all we saw was the light. We couldn't, we couldn't see the actual the thing clearly, but, you know, the shape of it was there. And, it, and uh, we saw the light, and we saw it raise up to a certain level, and then it, sh it streaked away. It just started, started off slow, and then it sh shot away. Uh, and it sort of, sort of across, but upwards. In other words, like it r rose up to something like 100 feet in the air, and then it, then it uh, shot off towards the northeast at a blinding speed. Did you hear any tree branches cracking or anything like that while it was doing no. that, moving? No. No, uh-uh. I know you're about 1,500 feet away, right? So, 1,800 feet. Oh, from feet. When, when it took off? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're a quarter of a mile away, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah not quite or a quarter. eighth of a mile. Uh, we've never actually measured that part. Well, the only thing we have measured is the distance from the truck up to where the UFO was, where Travis was, anyway. And that Mike. was uh, 93 feet. <laughs> That's it, huh? Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. it's me and Rich being un uneducated here, but both me and Rich... If, if you looked at our faces when Steve said he saw it fly off. I saw your face. You looked very surprised. Because we've not heard that before. Yeah. That's because people don't ask all the questions. They just, they, they, they're too eager to assume. And I so, think that's so you've what you told this did. to nobody that you, you guys saw it fly off? No, I have. I've said that numerous times. How about I pro originally? I probably, I've probably been on more radio shows than Travis has, or at least as many. Yeah. <laughs> did you, uh, did it, did, was there like a static electricity feeling, anything like that in the air when you were that close? No, we were, even when we were 93, 93 feet away, yeah. we didn't feel anything staticky. And there were a number of departures from the movie. I mean, you guys were both correct when you said the movie is bullshit because the movie is bullshit. It was a good story, but it wasn't the right story. <laughs> it had an all-star cast, but what difference does that make? It wasn't the story. <laughs> One of the biggest departures in the movie is that we all went back. And, and the movie shows me alone going back. In fact, it doesn't show me going back. It just has us talking about it. Uh, hmm. We all went back. And we, and we got out of the truck and we searched all over the area before we went to Heber. Before we I, reported it, I heard you. Did, didn't I hear that you got upset when you went back because you realized that Travis was gone? And you and you, those were you were upset because you were happy that he would disappeared and That's his right. body wasn't. Yeah. Well, I, I had I had a kind of a double emotion there. One was because of the the whole thing was just mind blowing. But the other part was because once we got back and we could see that Travis wasn't there after we looked around the area, okay, that's when I actually broke down. And I did break down. Steve's right about that. Um, he says I bawled like a baby. I think he's exaggerating there, but, uh, yeah, I cried. I went to my knees, and I was, I was very uh, emotionally distraught because Travis wasn't there which uh, meant to me that he's still alive. Now, I, I'm going to go a little deep. So, you know, we said we could talk about anything. I'm just going by things I hear and other interviews and things of that nature when I ask this. But um, apparently you and Travis were these kids who would make up stories about seeing aliens and UFOs and were known <laughs> as the abductee kids where, in the neighborhood. Where did that, where did that come from? Is that not, that's not Travis true? Travis and I weren't even together as kids. Is that right, Ollie? Am I, am I hearing that? Am I saying that wrong? Yeah, I don't, I, well, yeah, you're saying that wrong. I don't know where you got it from, but you heard it from somewhere and it's, it's complete baloney. Yeah, I've heard that several times. I didn't even know what a UFO was until I was about 18 or 20 years old. And that and you I, guys would tell everybody in the neighborhood you're seeing aliens and UFOs. I and, don't know where that probably came from Ryan Gordon. Because Ryan Maybe. Gordon just makes up crap. He really does. He, 
Nice. It's like Phil Class. You know, I've I've dealt with oh. skeptics my entire the entire forty six years that, since worse. this thing happened, and he just makes things up, just like Phil Class made things up. He would he would make up stuff and call it evidence, and then and then he would attack his own evidence as though it meant something. But he made it up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not evidence. He 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 creates the I don't know what you call it, the straw dog or the or. Uh, there's a lot of things, logically speaking, that you can say about it, but it but uh, it was basically just bullshit from the beginning. Man, Did, didn't you send Philip Crass? Uh, Philip Crass? <laughs> Philip, <laughs> Philip, Philip, might as well Philip, be. Yeah, Philip Class, um, a uh, Christmas card every year, a religious. Oh one. yeah, that's correct. That's right. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, within the guy's an atheist. Exactly. Within three or four years that he, before he died. I actually would, uh, he would he would call me. I never did call him. He would call me. He's always done it that way. He always calls me. He tries to catch me off guard or something. And uh, he's been calling me ever ever since 1975. I've talked to him a couple of dozen times on the phone during that time. And and over the over the uh, over all that period of time, we kind of developed a rapport, you know. <laughs> and, and once he was out of it. After the movie was made and all that, he kind of took a different attitude about it altogether. And a couple of times, he came very close to admitting to me that he that he believed it. Really, I've he heard that he, before. He, yeah, he didn't he didn't say that he believed it, but he came real close because the way we were talking, if you could have could have heard the the uh, conversations, you'd understand what I'm saying. Um, how you can say something but not really say it. It was like that. Has it been difficult? I mean, the if you've got an experience, which I think would, I mean, obviously, if it, if it happened to anyone, it'd be one, like one of the most monumental experiences of their lives. Has it been difficult, like dealing with so much negativity and the fact you've had to continually justify this over and over again? And obviously, you've had various reasons of why people would think you were lying about it o- over the years. Well, of course, it's been difficult. I mean, any, it would be difficult for anybody. Uh, but uh, one thing Steve said that I can second, and that's he said that uh, people have uh, re- reacted negative to this, but it hasn't all been negative. Uh, a lot of it has been uh, the reverse of that, basically speaking. Uh, and and it's kind of like, so what if if we would done something different? It did. It happened the way it happened. So, why second think it? I mean, you know, it happened, and you deal with what happened, not not what could have happened, or what should have happened, or what you wish would have happened. Too much of this world goes along the lines of what people would desire to be true, instead of what is true. Mike, That's- can I step back just 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 a touch? Because you started with you started wanting to address. Uh, Ryan Gordon. Now, he did he did put a uh, confession um, <laughs> tape out of you that that you've you've said on on a few shows now that it was manipulated. I've heard a lot of other people say it's manipulated. I I said to you today when I rang you um, when I was in the car, I'm not going to say a bad word about Ryan Gordon. I I, I have no problems with Ryan. Uh, he's done nothing to me. In fact, he's 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 been absolutely fine with me, and he's helped me do stuff in the past. So he's I, real I nice. I, he's near real nice to radio hosts. I have no problems <laughs> with him. Yeah, well, he but, deliberately does that. He's not. Right. He's, he's not going to burn his bridges. What I want to ask you is: so you said he manipulated that tape, but you also said you recorded him. When yes. you went out with him, yeah, it, that's right. To gent- it, to to the site, right? I have did. you put? I have not heard that recording. Well, you haven't heard it yet because I haven't had him do the right thing first. I'm waiting for him to do the right thing, and that is to uh, give me an opportunity to catch him. I'm waiting for him to make the big mistake of saying that it didn't that I didn't record him and that I didn't say those things. You see, I, I went to the site with him 
apparently the day after he recorded that telephone conversation with me that is not what I said. And uh, when we were at the site, the only reason I went there is because he kept pushing me about this, about being a hoax, and he wanted to get into it in detail. So I went out there with him. We walked over the entire thing, and we looked at everything. And by the time we got down, we, we walked down the lower road and up the side, and we looked at all the trees and the various things that happened, and we got up to the top of there, and up there, up there basically where Travis had been standing, and I told him, I said, Ryan, there is no way this could be a hoax. Because, to see, he was going at it as though it was a hoax to me rather than, like, me being a hoax, me being part of it. Uh, so he was playing that side of the street, and... Uh, so I was telling him there's no way it could be a hoax, and I gave him all the reasons why. Uh, because, first of all, uh, and you you got to separate this from the Gentry Tower thing, okay? But just on the as on the basis of the story the way it was, the tree growth, for instance, we just talked about that before we got to the top of the ridge there, and the tree growth is a whole thing by itself, and that's happened since then. I says that's one thing, and then during then the thing we've already talked about here, where once we had gone up the road and left there and and up the road an eighth a quarter of a mile away, we got out of the truck and the thing lifted up and took off. You know, if it was a hoax, if I'd have been hoaxed, if all of us had been hoaxed, we wouldn't have seen those things. Those things wouldn't be a part of it. So when I look at it from my mind, and Steve does with his mind. Of course, Steve looks at it very differently than I do anyway, but but with those particular facts, you know... Steve thinks you're all fooled by the government. Right. But he doesn't have a way in which that was done, so it's just kind of a general statement. Uh, I, I get into it a little more definite than that, a little more fact-based. If it had been, if we had been hoaxed, it wouldn't be anything at all like what actually happened. This thing hit Travis with a beam that that knocked him up and back so hard. There's no way, and he could have even done. He couldn't have even acted the part. It was. Imp it would have been impossible. Something hit him with such force that it blew him back to where his feet landed ten feet. His body, his head landed like sixteen, seventeen feet away because he landed flat. You know. And uh, that was so dramatic and so dynamic that. It, it couldn't be faked. We all saw that. It was one part that I did see. I didn't see the light hit him because I'd turned away. But but the the light that hit him, I looked back and I saw it hit him and I saw him being blown back. It couldn't have happened if it was fake. It just couldn't happen. If, and that's if and that's if it was done right now with today's technology. If you were to try to explain what it looked like, would it, I'll give you an example. Did it look like an invisible cannonball hit him and his body caved inward? Or did he get his arms and legs flail? Did he shake? I mean, what did you see? Well, you want me to describe the UFO first or him being hit? I'd like to know what it looked like when he got hit. How did his body okay. contort or did it? Was it like a rag doll? Well, it... Uh, I can't demonstrate it here because I don't have my camera. <laughs> but, Understood. Uh, I couldn't couldn't anyway. Anyway, you know you've you've seen the paintings I've drawn because I've done more than one. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. That's the scene taken, you know, like you know, a split second after he's hit, and and uh, his body did did sort of cave in, but not completely. It was forceful enough that just lifted him as one whole unit. It wasn't like it hit him on the chest in such a way that it would cause just his chest to go back and his arms to go forward. It hit him as though it, it was a, it was an explosion in front of him big enough to throw his entire body back. Wow. And he, and he, went, he went back, like I said, and he went in the air. He went, he went up as well as back, and he landed flat on the ground, and, and the, there was a little bit of dust there. It hadn't rained for quite some time. And uh, even though there was some pine needles there, it was, there was a ground there too. And uh, the, the dust rolled around him. It was, uh, like I say, very dramatic. It was. Uh, how as, how as fast it, do you think he was pushed back? Like 20 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour? Could you have gauged that or take a guess? Because apparently yeah, yeah. he thinks, Travis thinks he was dead and they picked him up and repaired him, right? So 
Yeah, that's, that's what the Travis case. thinks. That's one of yeah. Travis's concepts. Uh, give a speed to it. Gosh, I'm I don't just know trying, how to yeah. do it. It'd be okay. more like uh, bang, blow back, hit the ground. Just how fast is that? Pretty quick. I don't know. It sounds yeah. fast. Pretty it sounds darn like fast. like 50 yeah. miles an hour or something or 100. Yeah. Who knows? Interesting. But he did stop. He stopped when he hit the ground. But he kind of bounced. So, so he hit the ground with still some force behind him and some backwards force. So he hit and bounced a little. Wow. Okay, that's pretty fast. <laughs> and it's, and it's, uh, it was something that scared the hell out of all of us. I mean, that's, that's why I turned the truck back on and left. <laughs> you would think you were next at that point, I would think, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, at that point, I was wondering why the truck was even off. I didn't wonder. It was just, it was just off, and I had to turn it back on in order to leave. So it took, took a few seconds to leave from the time he hit the ground. Oh, man. We, we, we spoke earlier about it being nothing like the film Fire in the Sky for anybody who's in the audience. Um, no, and, and, you met, and you mentioned, do you want me to tell you what the craft looked like? So, so uh, yeah. you've probably, yeah, I know you've said it a hundred times before. <laughs> well, the film, the film Fire in the Sky is not that uh, image at all. It's, it's what I painted. Now, the first painting I did of this was rather cartoon-like. It was deliberately for a, for a cover of a, of a paperback book, and I talked to the art director, and, and I did what he th said I should do. I would, have, I would have drawn it, you know, I would have painted it more realistic, but they told me that it needed to be on the, and they told me the size of the cover and all that stuff, and he filled me on what it needed to look like, and I pretty much, you know, did that. Uh, and the next time, I, all I painted was the beam and Travis, and I didn't paint the UFO, but I did paint the UFO separately. Uh, so all, all those pictures put together is what it looked like exactly. As close as a human can come to duplicating something on canvas. And uh, surely you've seen all of those particular illustrations. They're all available. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I've seen them. Um... They're all in his book. And uh, yeah, there, so uh, whatever whatever you see in those paintings, that's that's what it was. Without me describing it vocally here. So you you saw Travis get shot back. You drove off quite a bit bit down. And then you you got out. You saw the UFO take off, mm -hmm. and then you went back. Well, we didn't go back immediately. Uh, one thing Steve is wrong about, he's got this idea in his head that we didn't, we didn't chase a camper down. We did not chase a camper down, but I did go out on the rim road because I had to do that to turn around. The, the, the road we led in there was so, so narrow that we actually had to dig out places in order to get through because it had been closed. And we made it just, the spots just wide enough to get through and, and cut a few limbs and whatnot to make a path down through there because the road was officially closed. And so there was no way to turn the truck around without going out to the rim road, which was just a uh, sixteenth uh, of a mile, you know, 100, 100, 100 yards away. And we went up to the rim road, I got on the rim road, and I had to go down the rim road a ways. And there was a, there was a pickup that had passed there while we were still sitting there. We'd gotten back in the truck, and we were looking out forward, and the, and the truck was pointed towards the rim road. And... Uh, we saw this vehicle go by, don't know what it was, but uh, somebody yelled, you know, we need, to, we need to get some guns, we need to chase that, that truck down. Just because Steve heard that doesn't mean that that's what I was doing. I was just simply mm -hmm. going out to the main road to find a place to turn around. It's what I, what I did, went out down the rim road a ways and got a ride spot there and I turned it around and went back. But, but you saw, you all saw the, the craft take off into yeah. space yeah yeah that was when i first stopped the truck so i'm, I'm gonna ask you this mike because i've got to ask you this and you said we can ask anything i'll answer so, any so question <laughs> you, you made a statement and and rich if you wouldn't mind reading the following on screen sure i mike rogers being of sound and rational mind do hereby give notice that i am no longer to be considered a witness to travis walton's supposed abduction of november 5th 75. that's exactly right wow why is that if because you saw somebody the... kept asking me 
kept uh, assuming that we all saw Travis get abducted. We did not. Not one of us. And I got so tired of being asked that question or having people assume that, that I had to say something in a major way. And so I placed this ad on my Facebook page. But, you know, I think people think that means the entire event. I think they're, <laughs> they're wording it wrong or, you know what I mean, when they talk no, to you. They're taking right? it wrong. They are not yeah, they're taking it the wrong. words. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. The word is supposed, supposed abduction. But I, I searched for words to explain that and be exactly proper with it. And that was the best I could come up with. His abduction was supposed. Right. But there, I think what people, when people talk about Travis Walton, they go, oh, the abduction story. So they don't say, oh, the UFO those guys saw. They always say yeah. the abduction, the guy who well, was abducted. That, I think that's why people put that. Two, they blanket the yeah, whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they shouldn't do that. No, I and know. That was, that was my whole point in putting that on my page. Good. That's smart. Because, Probably confused a lot of people. No, I mean, <laughs> because people were getting me angry about it. They just yeah. wouldn't leave it alone, especially when once I said that. I said it on a couple of radio shows, and they just wouldn't leave it alone. And uh, so I, <laughs> I put it in words, in a strong words, in a big square, you know, with my face on it. <laughs> I mean, it sound, sound mine, you know. Uh, uh, you know it, it's, it's, it's as uh, technically legal as I could possibly make it. Oh, you worded it perfectly. <laughs> you did. I mean, that would make me a little confused, too. I'm like, he, what does he mean? <laughs> what did Travis say to you when you put that out? Yeah. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't happy about it, but he, but he knows it's true. In fact, Steve knows it's true. Every, everybody knows it's true. I mean, how could, we, how could we possibly say that we saw him get abducted when we did not? No disrespect. If I, if I was with Lee, Rich, in, in a car, and... Uh, I don't know. Uh, Lee got out one. Well, I'll probably leave him anyway. But Lee got out, <laughs> and and me and Rich drove down, and we both saw a craft take off, and then Rich put out a few years later that he 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 wants nothing more to do with the story, and and he can't support the story anymore. I would turn around to Rich and say, Rich, what the fuck are you talking about? We both saw the craft take off. Yeah. Mm. So that's this. That's what this this here, Mike. For me, does make it makes no sense. It no, it does make sense. It makes sense to me. It makes a hundred percent sense. There's more than just one part of this event. I mean, they mm -hmm. saw the light hit Travis. Then they took off. They didn't see him get taken away. No, I agree they were far with away. that. So that's, that's an that's accurate all, yeah. that's an accurate mm -hmm. statement. That's all the statement was meaning was that that we did not see him get abducted. That's all it mm -hmm. meant. But when you put that out, Mike, in your head, where did you think Travis had gone? I have no idea. How would I have an idea? To to put something in my mind that I did not witness would be a falsity. Mm. But you didn't think Travis may have hoaxed it. I didn't know what to think. I never have. You know, very few people have ever asked me what I really think. Uh, I have to make statements like this to even get people to get the idea that I have something to say of my own different from what everybody thinks I should say. Yeah, you, know, you must uh, know. People, yeah. people just assume things. They assume things. They assume way too much. They assume things wrong. They assume things right. They assume things falsely one way or the other. You know, if somebody would just ask me what happened, I would tell them exactly, like I have here. Anything mm -hmm. you ask me, I'll tell you exactly. I'll give and you I, as much detail I, as you want. And you said that to me today. You, I said, I said, is it, out of respect, I said, if any, is it, is, and Rich asked you the same question, is anything off limits? He said, no, ask what you want. Yeah. Which, which that I appreciate. but. The reason why I asked that question, Mike, is because I see so many people pussyfooting around that question, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's it, and it is so confusing to the community that absolutely, me being one, Rich being one, and and Lee just loves the film, um, <laughs> that it's it's to some people it's quite heartbreaking when you think this this and um, the best 
UFO story ever could be falling to pieces. And over the last few years, it it has it's felt to me like it's been falling to pieces. All I told assumption. you, I told you, all assumption. The only people that this is uh, breaks their heart is people who assume way too much, and they they will not believe what is true. They they have made it in their mind something to be a certain way and they see something that and they read something that's different from that and they just won't have it mm. they're going to believe the way they want to believe period the reality doesn't make any difference to them do people want more is that is that the problem when you have something that goes no, on and on they, well yeah they, more in they terms want... of more in terms of different or whatever it yeah. doesn't matter if it's more or whatever uh, they just want they, they want this to be absolutely true. And in order for this to be absolutely true the way they believe it is for us to have witnessed Travis's abduction. We did not. Now, that, that may be heartbreaking to some people, but it's a fact. We didn't witness anything. I drove off. They, they I mean, there was something there that happened so scary, so, so uh, I don't know how to explain it better than that. I hit the gas. I didn't need to be told. Mm. I hit the gas, and it, it took me, you know, a few seconds until I stopped the truck to, to realize what I'd done. But I shouldn't do that. That's why I stopped the truck. And we went back just as soon as we could, and we, we didn't find him anywhere. But personally, I would find the story less believable if you had have just hung around and watched <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, you wouldn't do it. If you saw, um, if you saw a bear coming towards you, it's, it, it, you wouldn't be one of those people that gets the phone out to take a selfie. You know, it's a, it's a stupid idea. You, you yeah. move. Uh, we may all be tough woods, woodsmen. Okay. Back then or not anymore. <laughs> We're all too old. <laughs> Two of us are dead. In fact, probably three of us, but, uh, this was back then when we were all about as, tough as men could be and we we're all in a, in a job that was a very hard job to do and you would expect people like that to be emotionally sound you just couldn't shake them. you're not gonna scare them with anything and uh, seeing a bear in the woods didn't scare any of us mm -hmm. something like that seeing a UFO didn't scare us but when, when we saw that happen the way it happened it uh, it put fear into all of our, our minds I mean it just devastated most all of us there wasn't one of us that wasn't affected like that well what went through your mind when um when you saw it because i, I always imagine the um the there must be like an a, an amazement and fear whatever of seeing something um and then did did you wonder to yourself whether was that was this like a it's going to be an occurrence, something that happens all the time. So I'm making, I'm, I'm not um, articulating myself very well here. But I always think when people see a UFO, especially in such close proximity, and it's such a like paradigm shifting event, do you did you think that like was this the like the beginning of War of the Worlds or something like that? No, I, I know what you're saying there. Yeah. You, uh, a lot of people, but you're you're thinking beyond thinking. Mm. To, to wonder that you don't have time to wonder that at the bar, spur of the moment mm -hmm. uh, to put it to put it into a timetable we come around that corner I didn't see anything I stopped the truck because I did not see anything it was it was too high and it was directly away from the truck the truck was parked in a way and the UFO was almost directly to the right side of the truck and above the above this ridge it was above the tree tops, except for a couple of very tall trees a little bit further away. It was about 20, 25 feet in the air. It wasn't Gentry, Tire, Gentry Tower 80 feet up in the air. It was 20, mm. 30 feet in the air. Anyway, uh, when I, after I'd stopped the truck and put, and put the emergency brake on, there was a slight incline there, I leaned over because now there was room now because uh, Ken Peterson was right there in the middle of the, you know, in the front seat. Uh, Travis had already gotten out, so I could, I could kind of lean down and, 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 you know, Ken Peterson understood what I was doing, so he didn't like slap him here. <laughs> what the hell are you doing, you know? I had to lean down basically in his lap to see it. And when I did that, I saw it for the first time and uh, uh, 
a, a, a question went through my mind, just a big blank question. What in the hell is this? Mm -hmm. That was my first thought. What in the hell is this? And it took my mind a few seconds to, to make anything of it. And when I did, I, I came to the realization that it was, a, it was an object that was in the air, hovering in the air, and it was motionless. It, at that point, it, it might have been making some minor sounds, but nothing loud enough for me to hear yet. And uh, within just a matter of seconds, Travis had walked up to the, as close as he could get to it, and I was, my, cut, my head was cut away from that. My thinking was cut away from, from everything at that point to wonder why Travis was doing that and what was going to happen because of him doing that. And he, he, yeah, he got up there to where he was as close as he could get, apparently. You got to understand that this whole entire thing took less than a minute. Mm -hmm. from, the, from the time I stopped that truck to the time we took off, it was probably somewhere around 40 seconds altogether. Why do you think Travis had the, the feeling to walk towards it? Say that again? Why do you think Travis had the, like, the, the feelings to go and walk towards it? Well, I've explained this on a couple of shows, several. Geraldo was one of them, you know, Good Morning America. In fact, a lot of them. I'd say, you know, that question would come up, and I'd say, you know, a few weeks before that, a bear ran across the road in front of the truck. Travis got immediately out of the truck, you know, because I had to stop the truck to keep from hitting the bear. Travis got out of the truck and took off running after it. That's all I say about it. But there's not time there to say more. The fact is, is that's something we had done on several occasions before. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, like a new thing. Travis was very adventurous. Uh, he was very brave. Uh, him and I together had done all kinds of things that were crazy things in the thinking of other people. We both had been into karate and boxing. We had both been we both boxed in the ring uh, more than one year. I mean, we did it, I did it for three years. Travis did it for two years. Had several bouts. I never lost a fight. Uh, Travis lost two, I think. But we both had good records, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, that's just one thing we did. Another thing that we did, we went, we went uh, spearing trout in a stream that was known for being a place where you couldn't catch a fish with a line and a reel. And we, we spent a day out there and caught caught some really large trout with a, with a spear, not not with a not with a. a gun or a line or a pole or anything, you know, or not a net. And uh, to get down into this place where you'd fish required some li uh, cliff climbing, both in and out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very, a very uh, dangerous trip there altogether. It just all kinds of stuff like that. We, we, uh, we both, uh, you know, took flying lessons and things like that, you know, uh, motorcycles, uh, I got into logging contests later on, and, and Travis thought about it, but but I did that, and I just I just filled my life full of adventure in every way I could. Travis was the same way. We didn't do the same things, but we, <clears throat> we were both adventurous people. And so the way to explain that, the way to answer that question is, uh, he went up to that UFO because it was an opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah. The yeah. only reason I didn't go up there was because I ha I had to stop the truck <laughs> and all that stuff. Mm. He was already out and already up there. And by the time I saw it, I realized it was a dangerous situation. Right about that time, it started making noise, and it got a little. It started looking more and more like a crazy thing to do as the seconds went by, as the very few seconds went by. And so, I didn't. I didn't get out myself. I stayed there, and it turns out that it was a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, so Travis has gone missing, and. I've heard you say this on, on other shows before, but Travis's mum didn't wasn't that concerned. Not true. You'd have to know what Travis's mom was. You got to understand that in order to find her that night, I mean, I knew where she was or where she probably was, and she was there. There's a, a a cabin called the Gibson Cabin, which she she lived in during the summertime, during the summer months of the year, and. Uh, she wasn't by anybody. No, she didn't take anybody with her. She was all by herself. She was an elderly woman, and she lived out there in the woods all by herself for a week at a time before she'd come back into Snowflake to her, to her house there. Uh, 
I never, I never once ever saw her cry or even look emotional. She was just almost an unemotional person. Uh, not completely unemotional, but she was one of these kind of people that, uh, yep, that keep an upper, keep a chin, keep your chin up. You know, uh, don't show your your emotion. Don't cry. Kind of, kind of the way a man is supposed to be, right? The way Steve would like me to portray him as. That. <laughs> He's always gotten upset because me and other people, including John, he he won't acknowledge that fact. John said right there on uh, Jennifer Stein's movie, the the Travis movie. He says right off the bat, the first thing John says is probably the most upset person there was Steve Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, Steve's quite upset about you. Well, not you because you didn't write. It's, uh, it's, does Steve think you wrote the book and you you haven't He's, wrote the book? Yeah, he actually said that. He said that to me. He said that on that show. It, well, it wasn't a misquote. That's what he thinks. He thinks that I wrote the book. Why? He thinks that all those things that are contrary to what he think, considers to be reality, which, by the way, is not contrary to reality. Travis knew the reality, and I helped Travis fill in those things. But he didn't just me. Uh, Steve says that Travis didn't interview anybody. That's bullshit. He talked extensively with Ken, 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 Ken Peterson to me, uh, to, uh, to John Gallette, even though... Steve doesn't admit that now. Steve wants reality to be his way. And so when somebody like John tells him, no, that's not the way it was, uh, Steve just goes ahead and thinks that's the way it was anyway. <laughs> I don't know how he does that, but uh, but he's that way. Uh, he's a likable guy, you know. Yeah, I, I like him. I like it. We were talking about, it, about yeah. Steve earlier. Have you two made up, by the way? I don't have anything against uh, Steve. He has his. He's the, got the problem against me, is what it is. Well, and we'll the problem, the problem he has is he thinks that I wrote all this stuff about him. I've tried to tell him many times, man, I didn't write that. And even if I did, that's the way it happened. He doesn't. He doesn't agree with that, so he takes it out on me. I don't know why he'd be bothered. He's seventeen years old. I think if I was seventeen and my one of my uh, guys had gone missing yeah. by a, an alien spacecraft, I would be. I mean, he said, strong. He, he says that I, I broke down and bawled like a baby. He doesn't he doesn't get a response from me out of that because I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say that I didn't bawl like a baby, but I, I broke down and cried. You know, I was very distraught for two reasons. One that Travis was missing. It was a dynamic situation. It was, a, it was an unknown situation. We were facing the unknown there, which is a thing all by itself. But also Travis was not there when we got back, which means he wasn't fried to a crisp on the spot. And so I was relieved besides, you know, the dynamics of it. So I, I slightly digressed then when I was talking about Travis's mother. So, Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I was trying to explain how she was living in the woods by herself. And that pretty much an ex explains the, the whole situation there. Uh, Copeland, who came there with me, the under sheriff Ken Copeland, he says that, and he's true. That's true. Uh, his mom didn't act concerned, but she wouldn't. Uh, he would. She wouldn't act concerned. What it would have gotten me is if she would have acted concerned, because that wouldn't be her. You, you would didn't have to she ask them to call call the search off? No. I don't so, remember of, of her ever doing anything like that. Because this is something again I've heard on many shows. <laughs> oh, she said. I think she said one time. I don't know why they're still searching. He's not here. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a comment. It's not. It's not an order to the police to quit searching. But you did know? she believe you, you, you fellas, that? Yeah, he she was, believed he was it. Yes. Yeah, she believed that because she believed me. Uh, you know, the stuff that you heard about. Somebody heard about about having a childhood that believed in UFOs, and I don't. I don't even remember all of what you said there what was heard that, that we were pranksters or something as kids. Yeah. Which you would, you would run around a lot when you would play and say, we, we just saw a UFO. We saw aliens. I don't know where that came from, but whoever said that is an outright ball faced liar because they had to make it up because they couldn't have based that on anything they could have got from anybody. It sounds to me like that. Somebody's heard, has heard stories of saying, Oh, the um, they used to play around when they were kids, and then they've 
added that on themselves, you know, because, mm-hmm. I mean, you could do that anyway if you wanted to discredit somebody. Like, name me children that didn't run around playing some sort of make-believe game. <laughs> there was no yeah. such thing in the, in the common understanding when I was a kid as a UFO. Yeah. It just it didn't exist. Mm. The concept of UFOs did not exist when I was a kid, especially in that town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It's amazing. Well, when something like that is said, it seems to mean so much at the time, but <laughs> who said it and where'd they get it from? I'd like to know where they got that from. Make them explain I, it. Make them, I, wanna sh- I want them to show me where they got that from. Maybe it was Ryan Gordon after all this. More Maybe than likely was. was, because Ryan has said those sort of same sort of things to me. Okay. And I know for a fact that he will make up anything he can to get attention and to, and to play this down. He's a skeptic of skeptics. He's, he's no different than Phil Klaus. He makes things up to have it his way. Right, to fit what they want to be real. Yeah. Right. And and Steve said some other things there about that Gentry Tower thing that... that uh, Ryan Gordon just seems to, he won't give up on it at all. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the first one that told him that, man, you can't even see Gentry Tower from that, from that site. So the next thing I heard was, oh, well, it all happened at Gentry Tower. It didn't happen where we said it happened. It all happened at Gentry Tower. Well, we had to go to work there every day. We had a certain route that we took. It didn't go by Gentry Tower. Gentry Tower would have been way the hell out of the way. No, that's, I'll tell you why they're bringing that up, because they said that... You and Travis, you know, hoaxed all this and nobody else knew about it. But you guys planned to take another route home that night, which brought you by the towers where you could see them better. And that's why they went that way. And nobody else would notice because they're all tired from working. They're all, you know, wanting to get home. So that's what was said. That's why. Why don't don't we just make it any crazy thing they want to make up? Because that's what he did there. Just any crazy thing he wants to make up. That's it. I mean... (laughs) <laughs> Gentry, if we would have seen Gentry Tower, we'd have seen a tower 80 feet in the air. We'd have seen the, the staircase leading up to it. Okay? Do, do UFOs have these big metal staircases going, you know, switch back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, going all the way up to the bottom of it? <laughs> they do now. <laughs> well, this one does <laughs> now, right? <laughs> and, Mike. And, and did they have a big uh, utility building at the bottom of it where right. they held the generator and all that stuff with a great big... A eight foot tall fence all the way around it, claimed chain link fence, so you couldn't possibly miss it because it's the the most obvious thing in, in your sight when you see Gentry Tower. You you would have to look past all that to see this lighted thing up there, which by the way is square. The UFO had it was round, the corners were round, it had a particular shape to it, and it wasn't anything like that. And if you're looking up at it, you can't see it. You only see that you only see that shape that that uh, squarey shape that's lighted if you're quite a ways away from it if but you're at, at the night, bottom of that looking up you don't see that you don't see the lighted part even at night even at night you can see the the edge of the windows but you're not going to see the a ufo thing but if you're uh, according to what i heard it, there's a little hill and you're where where you guys parked the truck there's a little hill that goes up so a whole right ridge. and they wouldn't be able to see gentry tower from the position that the truck was parked in right and that what he said yeah and, and that's all that's four miles away oh gee no right what yeah gentry tower is four miles away from the ufo site oh okay i got you now okay and, so and a whole different yeah. road goes over to it from where we went in and out of the oh, job yeah all there right. was there well, was two different roads we took into the job. One was on the on the west side, uh, that led up to the rim road, and the other was on the on the east side of the the site. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, you know both of them are like a mile or so away from the actual site, but there were two two routes that went up there, and neither one of them were anywhere near Gentry. Got it. Okay. Gentry See, Tower it's starting is, to make. Them. Uh, yeah, Gentry Tower is four miles away. Very vivid tower. Very uh, if you go up there close to it, it's very vivid. You would see all that. There's no way in the world that it could have been taken, mistaken by anybody, not even hoaxed by anybody as, as the UFO. That, that's just a, a very poor concept put forward by Ryan Gordon. That not fit did, anything. Didn't, uh, Ollie, didn't Ryan give you pictures of where it looks like from the distance from where the truck was supposedly parked to where Gentry Tower is? I, I think I had them before. Um, yeah, I, I saw some we- that he drew. 
But yeah. he'd have to he'd have to draw it or fix the photo somehow to make it appear that way. Yeah, right. A drawing doesn't go, cut go it. To the, go to the site and try to see if there's any position you can get into where you can get a UFO there that okay. you can you, that you can separate the the tower itself from it. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Mike. I mean, you, you said about going on with, with maybe with you wanted to go on with Steve. Have you ever thought about going on with Ryan just to call him out? on what he said about you because I was supposed was... to go on with Ryan one time, but he decided he was going to go on after me, which would give him the, the last say. And that's what he did. Okay. So I'm not saying this show, cause this is all about you, but right. down the line, would you maybe Steve if, <laughs> bring, bring in uh, Travis, if you want, um, please. Travis is uh, going to even speak to the guy. And I, and I told Ryan Gordon the last time that he called me, I told him to get the hell out of my life. I don't want to even talk to you anymore. Because Would what, you speak what, he's, to him? what he's saying, Ryan Gordon? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll speak to him, but not to nice. Put the, on, a, on a show, to put the records no, straight? No, there's, there's no way in the world I would, I, would, I would take part in a show that would actually be a formal two, two guys, maybe in opposition, but they'll talk to each other. Ryan Gordon is beyond that. There's no talking rationality to him because he doesn't know how, he doesn't know what rational is. He's got some crazy ideas that appeal to people who don't want to believe in this. And that's the only people that it appeals to. Anybody in their rational mind would look at that tower and say, there's no way in the world that could be taken mistaken for what we saw that night. The wrong shape, the wrong color. Uh, the tower doesn't make noise, especially that noise. It doesn't zap people and blow them back, you know, that far away. And then, and then it doesn't take off. Mm. Ali, um, if you've got a picture, there's a couple of people asking in the chat here, if you you can put one of the paintings up that uh, Mike drew of the um, of the UFO, if you've got one handy. Because I think that would be, so, be some right good now, context. Yeah, Ollie, definitely. Ollie can Mike, put up anything he wants, actually. Mike, could you send me that on my Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, well, what is your Facebook address? I, I can't say that on here live. Okay. But I, right, I, I, I understand. I, I, understand. I, I, I messaged you earlier. We've been speaking. Yeah. 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 Um, but well, I, won't, I won't call anybody uh, Ollie Smith or anything like that, okay? <laughs> That's my granddad's name. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. M Moonlich just uh, kindly did a 333. I think he knows my number. Uh, thank you, Moonlich. Uh, he but does. Did, did, do you know who Lou is, Lou Alexander? Why you get those pictures for me? No. Uh, who? See, you're not into ufology, are you? You just, you just, you just, no, you're just chilled the, now. No, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, there's only one thing I've done in ufology in the last few 20 years or so, and that's the Phoenix Lights. Right. The Phoenix Lights were a hoax. Yeah, he's, he's, well, really? Okay. Yeah. That's a good proof. conversation. I have proof. Wait, do you Rich? mean the 10 o'clock or the 8.15 time? Uh, the, the first one. Oh. The first oh, event. Yeah. That, they call it the first event. Yeah, that, well, there was two. The one where the, the real uh, UFO came over, and then at 10 o'clock, they dropped the flares from the Maryland gunnery. Right. Uh, yeah, well, the second event was flares. That's yeah, been yeah. proven. In Is my mind, it's been proven. So that's the first, the the first event. Talking? The first event was it was a, a large thing that I am convinced now was more than likely the, a government uh, creation. Could have been. It, it, yeah. it was a third of a mile in, in diameter, but that could be created. Yeah. Especially with government money. Me and Lee are and working I, on something on that because Lee I, found I some believe, information. I believe that they did that to find out where the public thinking was because they spend millions of dollars on that for, in all kinds of ways to find out what, what the public thinking is. Both know, for political reasons something... and for, for actual reasons. But to fly something that, you know, over a city that, as big as Phoenix, I lived there at the time too, so I know, but uh, I, I think it's a, a risky thing to do. What if it, you know, fell out of the sky for some reason. No. It was, uh, my belief is that it was created and it was uh, held in the air by lighter than air gas. And it had that, that very large shape to it all put together with, with uh, plastic and wire, very <laughs> right. light material. It was suspended by gas, but it had a way of, it had a way of flying. It wasn't flown. There was no pilot or nothing. There was no engines. It was actually carried on the wind. And, and the proof I have is that 
the 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 object as large as it was was actually carried on the on the wind all the way from up north all the way down across Phoenix and where it disappeared on down on the uh, southeastern corner of Arizona because that's the actual track of the wind and the and the object the speed of the object actually matches the speed of the wind at that altitude and we're not talking about on the ground people who thought it was just above their house it was just it, the same old uh, misconception that everybody has about that sort of thing uh, that something that large looked to be not moving it they thought it was hovering it, it would look that way but it was it was actually moving over 70 miles an hour and some sometimes uh, close to 90 miles an hour because the the wind you see uh the wind that that thing was carried in was actually in the in the lower uh what you might what you might call jet stream okay the jet stream winds go go up into 400 miles per hour where this thing was was down in the lower area where, where the jet stream was approximately 70 to 90 miles per hour and that thing went all the way from where it where it was up north down across it disappeared around uh casa grande and some people said oh it went all the way down to whatever that air force base is in tucson it never was seen past casa grande and the, and the area that where it was seen from uh, Prescott, uh, just just north of Prescott, down to Casa Grande, and you put that into the formula, the wind, the speed of the wind, and everything, and it's a match. And also the precise direction of the wind. You know the uh, Peter well, Dav that's the weird Peter one. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Davenport did a, a UFO map. And they thought it was like four or five or a dozen different objects, but it, well, it was just one object. It was just everybody was seeing one object and thinking it was, they all had different different descriptions. So Peter Davenport decided it was a, like uh, three different designs of triangular craft. <laughs> it right. Just, it, was just, it was just one one craft. And where did all these other craft go? No. Why, why wasn't there more than one object seen at one time? Now there's apparently sit over 60 different craft they're talking about. <laughs> I was there when they talked about it. I couldn't believe they were talking about it. Well, uh, I only saw one, and I don't know anybody that ever saw more than one. How, wh <laughs> where the hell did all these others come from? It's they're amazing. all seeing the same thing and just deciding it was it was all something different because everybody, no, mine had these many lights. Oh, well, mine had this many lights. Well, <laughs> the lights depended on where you were and whether or not they were visible at, the, at your particular point of view, you know? And as big as it was, the, the lights were not visible to everybody at the same time. There were seven lights total, never more than seven. The only time there was more than seven is the, is the second event. Mm. The, the I, uh, first event object was seven lights or less, always. But, but I interviewed over 100 witnesses to this event, and... I never heard anybody say something. I'll tell you why. Something that it was like the wind. Because many people, about 20%, said they saw the craft with its wings really wide out, like opened up. And uh -huh. then the, all of a sudden the wings came in closer together and then it shot across like two or two to five miles in an instant and then stopped. And that story has been told at least 30 to 40 times by some you can, witnesses. You can get all of that just simply by seeing something that size at night. I get, I don't, you know, I didn't see it, so I yeah. can't, I can't comment there's a lot, on that. There's a lot but, of natural phenomena in, in this. But I mean, also, uh, Kurt Russell was a pilot. He saw the yeah. lights at 8.15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he didn't see 20. No. He didn't see 70 mm -hmm. of them. He, he saw one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It was, it was a group of lights, I think he said he and, saw. And, and the elevation? What was the elevation? Geez, I don't remember. 1,500 feet, maybe? Right. It was low that's, at that's that not, time. That's mm -hmm. not 15 feet above somebody's roof, is it? <laughs> no. Hell no, it isn't. Mike, could you send me those pictures on the on the Facebook? And why you do I just want to go back to this uh, question that Jen asked earlier about... Um, if, if you, you fake, fake, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go on, Rich. You'll read it. Well, if you than fake me. an abduction, you will not agree to such force that you might bounce from the force that's life threatening. I, th I think that, she means that, that by trapping. That question is loaded. I know. I don't, I don't answer loaded questions. <laughs> uh, <Pick> apart. Uh, <laughs> let, let me let me simplify that. Uh, 
such for we not agree with such for us. Well, why wouldn't I agree with what I saw? I mean, what you see is what you see. I think what she means is Travis wouldn't agree to to have done whatever he, he did for all those guys to witness. I I think I'm getting that from that question. Yeah, to put himself in a life threatening you know, charge like that. Yeah, but the reason why I want to bring Travis that can back agree up to is what happened. He he doesn't think that he was in a life threatening situation. He didn't have time to think that. He had time yeah. to wonder about it, mm -hmm. but he didn't see the beam hit him, so he has no idea what what to think of that. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you, too. Uh, when Travis got out and walked up to it, when he was at, how long did it take for the light from the UFO to hit him? How long was he standing there? Ten, Ten seconds. seconds. Ten seconds at tops. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a long time, I think, it's to a, be that the, close. the whole thing, yeah. the max would be like 40 seconds. Oh, from wow. The time, from the time I stopped the truck to the time I took off in the truck would have been about... Best I can figure, around 40 seconds. I said before it was less than a minute. Yeah. 40 seconds is, is more exact. That's another reason why I wanted to bring that back up, um, Mike, is because Ryan did say on Erica Luke's show a few times that none of you saw the beam. You, Travis got out of the car. You drove off. Not true. Uh, Ken but Peterson saw why, the beam. You understand why I'm bringing that up, though, because yeah. that was said. Well, right. Uh, he hadn't talked to everybody. Two, two of us are dead. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, Ken Peterson is likely dead too. Uh, nobody's been made, made any contact with him for the last year and a half wow. or so. I, I used I used to make contact with him on on uh, you know email, but that that quit uh, about eight months ago. There was no, no more from him. He's the kind of a person that uh, he doesn't. He wouldn't talk about about to die or anything like that. He just, if he died, then if that'd be it. No, no more from anybody. He's got four sons that live in Tucson, and they're in the drywall business. And I haven't been able to locate them yet. So they might they might have changed their numbers and not want that to be talked about. They don't. They want maybe they want to shield him from this UFO stuff. Steve, well, on the other hand, was very religious about it. He had a whole religious concept yeah. about it all. Which I we mean, not, not Steve. Ken Peterson was very religious about it. Steve's yeah. religious as well. Yeah, yeah, that's what he says, right. Uh, but Ken Peterson definitely was religious, and we talked about it a lot. Mm. Actually, uh, Ken Peterson and I were, were lifetime friends. Uh, he's one of these people. You see, Travis didn't live in Snowflake to kick him out with me when I was three or four years old, you know, as a kid. <laughs> Ken Peterson was. We lived in Winslow, not Snowflake. Uh, my dad and I, my dad and mom moved there with, with me and, and uh, had all my other brothers and sisters after that. But uh, when I was four, we went to Winslow, and I was there until I was in high school before I moved back to Snowflake. During that time, Ken Peterson and I were best friends. And uh, so Ken and I had an awful lot to do. We had lifetime friends, like I said. Our lives were many, many times. I mean, uh, you know, all those years and, and since then. Once I came back to Snowflake, uh, he later on came back. Because he, he, all of his family is from Snowflake. And uh, he, him and I were very close. Where do you stand with thinking? Where, if Because I, I, are you a religious man? Me? Yeah. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not nowhere near religious. Mm. So, do you use a Mormon? You, what's that? I was a Mormon. Mm. Uh, um, the only thing, the only thing I hold today of the Mormon religion is, is the way of living. I believe in living clean. I don't believe in adultery or any, anything like that. I, I, mm -hmm. I believe in keeping. I, I want to know that my children are all mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, yeah, and, uh, it's a plus. And I believe in living clean, period, just everything. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I never have. Um, have you given any thought um, to, the, to what you saw when it comes to like some sort of spiritual experience? Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. And I do have some thoughts on that line, but um, they're, they're quite deep. And they're basically unexplainable. <laughs> I'd love to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lee's asking if, if, if do you think they're aliens? Uh, I'm kind of like Steve is. 
I'm not sure there is any aliens. Mm. If if there are, they might be government. You know, I don't know because I haven't seen any aliens. I haven't seen anything. It's just, it's like I hadn't I didn't see Travis abducted and I was dead, and none of us have seen any aliens. I don't know of anybody that has seen any aliens. Mm. You know, Travis may have. See, that's the thing right there. I am not saying Travis was not abducted. I'm not saying that he didn't say every, see everything that he says he saw. It could have, could have been that way. I'm just saying I didn't see it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and that, that bends people over. I mean, mm -hmm. it just messes people's heads real bad. And I don't know why, because it's a simple statement. It might be very, very formal-like, but it's just a simple statement. Well, I'm I think... sure. Oh, sorry, sorry, Rich. No, go, go ahead, Lee. Go ahead. Go ahead I was just going to say, I'm sure you've been asked this question before, but I mean, I, I haven't had the opportunity to ask it. Um, when you finally caught up with Travis when he came back and he explained to you what had happened to him, what? How did you feel about it? You know, it's, what what was going through your mind when he was explaining his experience? Well, it's funny that he said that because it was two days before Travis was back that I actually saw him, and when I did, he wasn't very talkative. And I wasn't there all that long to talk to him anyway. I, I was there for like an hour and a half. And uh, one time we, we went out on the sidewalk and we're walking down the road and just talking about things. But we did, he wanted to stay away from the, the abduction. I would ask him questions about it, but I didn't ask some real hard questions or anything because he didn't seem to be in a position to want to answer that sort of thing. And so we just talked about normal stuff. It, it was actually later on he, when he actually finally came up to the mountain, he, he rented an apartment right ne right next to my house, almost connected to my house, but it was different. And uh, when we started talking about writing a book, uh, I started pushing him on it. I was the one that pushed him with about the book and also about doing the paintings and all that. I was all my idea to begin with. Uh, it might have been in his head, but I'm the one that pushed it. And uh, we started talking about it a lot. And it was during that time that I first heard about everything. Up until then, I hadn't really heard what happened to him. Uh, and uh, Sheriff Gillespie went down to Phoenix uh, like the day before I was there and talked to him. And Sheriff Gillespie got it all mess, messed up. Uh, and because of that, he doesn't, doesn't believe that Travis was telling the truth because he got things all crossed around in his mind. First time Travis told me about it, it all jived. Mm. But not, none of it that doesn't make sense. People make so much of things on the basis of what they preconceive. Preconception, bias, is everything to people because they just do it whether it's right or not. You They're put a lot of work it. into that book. What's that? You put a lot of work into the book. What book? Travis's? Yeah. Ill illustrations and what have you. Illustrations, you yes. And, yeah. and of course, I, I did my part and explained to him to what I what happened during the time he was gone. But Maybe that's why Steve one. blamed you for it. I, I think Tra Travis himself said something about me being very involved with him and, and figuring out what happened during the time he was gone. Uh, in fact, I even I even told Steve one time that I gave Travis several pages one time. I wrote several pages about it. Uh, some facts, you know, during that time that gave him something to go on, but I did not write the book. It was, it was uh, I don't know, I don't know how many pages it was, it was handwritten. I didn't even have a typewriter. And that was... Uh, I, I wouldn't blame you if you did write a book, to be perfectly honest. The, uh, I, I, wouldn't invo I wouldn't blame you be, if you were involved in the writing of the book. If I was yeah. to leave my house and see a fucking dinosaur, you can be damn sure. <laughs> now you can be damn sure next month Lee Stevens met a fucking dinosaur would be on the bookshelf. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a great title. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard you don't get royalties from that book, Mike. Hell no. That's one of my biggest problems with Travis. Uh, we've we've had gone along, around and around about that. Uh, I think Steve made some reference to how how I'm one of the ones that makes money off it. No, no, I don't. I Travis makes money off of it. I have I don't make anything. Steve got paid for his interview from you. <laughs> I guess from Dave. I didn't pay him. Yeah, I guess Dave paid him, but but uh, I didn't give him any money. And so you're not there, giving me any money. There's Dave. a thing right there. When when it so, I I'll be honest with you, Mike. 
a few months ago, maybe a year, year and a bit ago, I was all ready to accept this as being a hoax. But then I asked myself, you guys are making nothing off this, the, the no. Walton case right now. Walt, Travis is making all the money. Uh, I, I don't know what he makes off, but apparently it's, apparently it's quite a lot. Uh, why, why would... Why would you still stick up for the story after all these years if it was a hoax? Well, I wouldn't. What I'm sticking up for is the truth. Mm. Actually, Ryan Gordon offered me $25,000 if I would, would uh, say that all the stuff that he's saying is true. Uh, basically, that's a hoax. And, and he came up with this uh, supposed recording. Yeah, he recorded me on a phone. He didn't tell me he was doing it. Uh, and then when I heard it, uh, I, I'm thinking, you know, this is crap. He's done something to that tape because I did not say that. Mm -hmm. I have never once. I mean, why in the hell would I suddenly, after 46 years, tell Ryan Gordon that it was a hoax? For the first time, the first person that ever, I mean, there have been skeptics on my ass for 46 years. Why would Ryan Gordon be the special person to hear this? But he offered me $25,000 if I would go along with it. I told him, hell no. So he offered you a bribe to yeah, go he, along? Yeah, he, he offered me $25,000, and I have it in writing. I have an email from him to that fact. Well, if you want to make money out of it, uh, out of it I, I would imagine a good time to have done it if you wanted to come out and say that it was a hoax would have been around when Travis was on Joe Rogan. You know, considering that the story was like the the biggest it's been for X amount of years. Travis went on a show which is essentially like going on every prime time television show in every country in the world at the same time. Yeah, um, that would be a time I would I would have thought if you were going to come out and say anything like that, it would be the time to do it. Yeah. Um, did you watch the interview he did with Joe Rogan? Uh, I saw part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't. Ha I didn't have the time at the time to actually listen to the whole thing, but I saw part of it. Did Did you find it bizarre that all, all these years it was so like there was such a spotlight put on the story again? Travis has never said anything about the case that I that I disagreed with. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't agree disagree with him saying that he was abducted. I'm just saying I didn't see it. And people get that all messed up in their head. I think it's because they want they they want to have, to think that you saw a beam hit him and him slowly get levitated off the floor into <laughs> yeah. a craft. That's what people want. That's exactly what they want. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, that's what they want. But that isn't what happened. And if I was to say something like that, if I was to even go along with it, somebody would certainly pop up and say, "Ah, you're a liar," and they'd be right. Mm -hmm. I'm telling Steve. the truth, period, even though it's contrary to my good. Do and, you think... and people don't see that. But I, what I, that thing I said, I, Michael H. Rogers, being of sound mind, you know, that is contrary to what would be, you would consider to be good for me. I said it because it's the truth. It was just a matter of, of the fact that, that it was true. Yeah, but people don't read. They just look at the pictures, it seems. Then nobody looks at the details, the fine details. Right. They go with they go with something and they get uh, triggered by it and they can't think straight for some reason. If I had one thing to say about ufology, even though I'm not into it more than the Phoenix Lights case, and that would be that you have believers and you have skeptics. And that's all there is. Believers are going to be believers, and skeptics are going to be skeptics, and nothing you can do can change any of them. You can change them a little bit, but it usually just doesn't stay. A person, a person can be a believer, and then they hear something, they say, oh, well, maybe this is a hoax, but they don't believe it's actually a hoax. They just think maybe it's a hoax, and they'd like to hear something different about it, so they keep listening. But believers are believers, and skeptics are skeptics. I've never met a skeptic yet that became a believer. I've heard people say that, but I've never seen it. Why do you think Philip Clasp was on the the clasp of, <laughs> of turning then before he passed? 
I think he because knew he was going to die soon. I think he knew he was going to die soon, and I think he knew it was the truth. You know, and you were no, nobody, nobody, in spite of the fact that Phil Class made up a whole lot of crap about this case, he knew the truth of it. He, he, more than anybody, had dug into this case deeply. I mean, right to the bottom, and he couldn't find a thing wrong with it. That's why he started making up stuff, and he literally made things up. And uh, I think later on in life, he realized that, well, he stayed with it because he had signed too many contracts that he would have been in trouble if he didn't. But, uh, you know, that's what it seemed to me like. He was just, he was just seeing that it was definitely for real. He knew it was for real because he had, he had been with an organization that found it to be real. And uh, in all this time, 46 years, nobody has ever put this thing down. And I guarantee you right now, Ryan Gordon is far from putting this case down. If there's anybody who believes this is a hoax, it's because they believe, because that's what they wanted to believe to start with. If they wanted to believe it happened for real to start with, then that's what they believe now. I can tell you now, Mike, you've got a panel right here, right now, that want this to be 100% real. Yeah, you know, I can tell that. And he, <laughs> Mike... Mike sounds like he's telling the truth, where I hear other people don't sound this truthful. And I know Scott Brown in the chat room has been calling you a liar. Mike is a guy, in Scott Brown, who's friends with Ryan Gordon, says you're a liar. He's been well, calling me out the is. whole time. Yeah. And uh, I asked him if he can, uh, you know, tell me what, what you're lying about. Let me ask a question for you, but I haven't heard back yet. But I think you sound truthful. And I, and I don't know 100%, but... You sound more truthful than even Travis sometimes. I mean, it's, but we, it's we can't look him in the eyes, Rich. Can't look <laughs> him in the eyes. Hey, no. hey, that's why my camera. I don't have my camera. <laughs> that's what they're going to say, Mike. That's what they're going to say. <laughs> the truth is in the eyes. You can't look at me in the eye, in the face. <laughs> hey, hey, Mike, yeah. from the love of Jennifer here, uh, and it's, it's a very good question, actually. Do you actually believe in extraterrestrials? Me? Yeah. Well, that's another question. I've already answered that question. I, no, I, I, I don't believe and I don't disbelieve. It's, it's, it's another, one of those things that is unanswerable. I've not seen anything personally myself. I can tell you this. There isn't 70 different species of aliens out there all warring among themselves over which one of them is going to take over Earth. It, that's a bunch of crap mm -hmm. entirely. And I'm just saying that logically because I don't know. But just logically speaking, why in the world would there be 70 species, especially the kind of aliens that these people think are out there? It's if aliens rude. exist, if aliens exist, which they must exist, they're not going to be anything like what people describe them to be. No. For the first thing we do is uh, is humanize them anyway. That's, to, that's what people uh, do. That's yeah, right. We made them bipedal. We give them emotions, be it like benevolent or malevolent. malevolent. Um uh, who, who knows? I mean, personally, I'm not. I'm not massively convinced that we're we're being visited by aliens from other planets. I think there's something weird. I think there's something weird in the world. But when you look back in history, at like photographs of a uh, Renaissance paintings where it looks like these these things are in the sky, I feel if we were being visited from another planet and it wasn't something like right. a bit crazier than that, we'd know it. It, it would be we'd still be seeing these things all the time and be at least be open to it because it would be something that had been happening. Like we understand when we see birds in the sky and we understand yeah. when we see planes in the sky now because we see them all the time. So if this had been something that was going on, we would be more used to it. Well, along those lines, well, it's not really mm -hmm. along those lines, but I can tell you that uh, since uh, 1975, I've had, had two, uh, periods in my life when when something something just as bizarre as happened in 1975 has happened to me and one of those was when I was logging up on the north above the north rim of the Grand Canyon and that's a whole thing by itself but that was a spear that came over and and uh, something that you can relate to would be in southern England crop circles mm -hmm. I'll tell you a quick story about it I had been going to England because I started, I started studying the Phoenix Lights, and I had gone to England as, as a part of, you know, promoting fire in the sky. But after that, I went went back to England because I wanted to find out more about crop circles. In the process, 
I got with these people who were who called themselves the, the circle makers. Mm. And this guy named John Lethgren uh, was head of that. And uh, I would watch them make crop circles at night and even there in the daytime for TV things. And, and they were doing it uh, because not just for an artistic expression, but they were doing it because they could make money at it. Mm. Money, money very often is the reason behind everything like that. Anyway, uh, when I was there in 1976, I decided that I was going to try to lay out a, a crop circle for my, for my own, on my own and see what I could do with it. And I went out late one night after 1 o'clock, and uh, I had thing, everything ready. I, I knew the process because I'd watched these guys doing it a whole lot of times. I'd watched several big crop circles being made. And uh, so I was, I was out there, and I, I went under a fence to go into this field that I had picked out. And when I looked up, I saw an orb, what they call an orb, okay? And it was, it was green, it was, it, was, it was jumping around over the field. And I happened to have in my pocket a pair of uh, UV sunglasses, but they were very strong. You know, they were, they were about as strong as you could get. And uh, I put them on, and, and for the first time, I could see the inside some workings inside the orb. It was, it was kind of blurry, but I could, I could see structure in there. And the, the orb was going going around, and it made a crop circle in less than a minute while I was watching. If you can imagine that happening. Mm -hmm. And that was as big a mind blower as when I saw Travis get hit by that beam. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, uh, uh, oddly enough, um, anyone wants to listen to more of this story, it was uh, when on the podcast I did last night with Ollie, uh, which will be out on Wednesday on Musi Audio. I talked about the, the time I, I saw something strange in the sky and I saw a green orb. Um, it was about a seven, seven or eight second sighting going. Let me see it. Through the sky. I haven't got a picture. Come on. The, I, uh, I did a painting of, of this green orb, by the way, Ollie, that I can send you as well. Yeah, so, so, Mike, if you could send them across. Um, I want to see these. Yeah, yeah, the great paintings. I should have I, literally, because I'm working the day, I've not had a chance to put them up yeah. uh, in, in the thing, and I should have done that. There's um, a, oh, go ahead. Go, no, Rich, go. I was looking for the photo, the, the paintings myself, and uh, I came across a guy named Mark Rogers, who does Alien. Ah, and never, it's amazing what he can do. I. I didn't know if you ever heard of that guy, but man, alive. No, never heard of him. Certainly never met him or talked to him. Yeah. So here's the thing. I asked Mike, I asked you a few hours before the show. I rang you on the way home and I said, is there anything you want to promote for the show? Because I like to do oh. that for people. And you just said, no, I'm not bothered. And you just said, there's my mate that's got, he owns all the paintings. Because you, you, you sold them to him ages ago, and people can find them. No, what are you talking about? I mean, you lost me here. The, those paintings, the, the six paintings. Yeah, the six paintings. Well, I asked you if you wanted were, to promote yourself, and you said no. There, there were ten of them. Uh, what I'm saying about promoting, I go ahead. They're for sale again. They don't. I don't own them anymore. I sold them all to this guy, and he wants to sell them. And we've sold several. Okay, and he's paid me for for my percentage of that. That's all I'm promoting is the fact that they're try he's trying to sell all of these paintings and there's there's six left and uh, and they're the pe the people that have bought them so far want, want to buy want to own them for because they feel that they're a part of history. I would love one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no what what I'm saying there Mike is that I was very surprised because normally people just say yeah, I get, I'll give you the links to this that and the other. But you don't. You didn't do that, and and I I, I think that's that speaks volumes about your character. Yeah. You know, they you you you've come on a show for nothing. Yeah, you're telling your story. You've got. Well, Dave told me he'd give me fifty bucks, but I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you I know, I, I I really did like Steve Pierce. Oh, I oh did. Did, did I say Dave or Steve? No, no, you said Dave said he'd give you yeah, 50 bucks, yeah. but I'm saying well, that's, that's Dave right. paid Steve, but yeah. I, I, do, I do actually like Steve. He's a character. Yeah. Well, the only, the only thing I have against Steve is the fact that he's got stuff against me. Uh, other than that, it'd be fine. 
when I do talk to him, uh, if, if, he, if he accused me of something, which he d seems to do every single time, naturally I'm going to counter it. And he doesn't like that. <laughs> you know? I'm not agree with him that he's right, you know. Uh, that's what I have against Steve. Otherwise, Steve is a likable guy. He's not too well educated, but he's a likable guy, you know. Well, I mean, he's a religious man. You, you've dabbled in in religion, and and, and I'm asking you about what you think this could be. Jen's kindly done another super chat, uh, asking them, what do you think bounced your friend? What's that say, Lee? In, into be, be, into, uh, then what do you think bounced your friend? Into I think she not needs to, being I think she needs to figure out how to actually write a sentence there. <laughs> but what, <laughs> that sentence is not structured properly. Uh, sometimes all. when you type on, on the phone, probably type yeah. on the phone, I do the same. I'm yeah. dyslexic, so I can't type in the sentence. I, but no what, what, do, you, what, do, you, what yeah. do you think about what do you think it was? Do you think it was aliens? She said bounced off. What does she mean by that? I I think she means what do you think sent him flying? I think you know it's what what took uh what was it? Yeah, it was, but, it was, it was energy. Yeah. Other than that, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. could have been electricity. It could have been something else. I have no idea. Yeah. I can tell you what it looked like because mm. I saw that. Did it have like? Did it have structure, or was it just a, was it like a spotlight? No, it, it, had, was, it had structure and also mm -hmm. had force. Yeah. Uh, it it had a feeling of force. You know that, that you could actually feel like a like a shock wave. Yeah, yeah, like it's like if you if you slam the door in your house and you you feel the pressure yeah. change that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not only did the beam hit Travis, but but it kind of gave a shock wave. Like I could mm. feel that. Okay. Um. um well, I, what I find interesting as well is the fact that you you said how short the the whole thing was because usually when uh, people are talk to, uh, start talking about things like this, it's you always get hit with. Um, oh, it was, I felt like it was in a dream state or uh, mm. time seemed to melt away and disappear. But the way you're explaining it is it's, it's something that's uh, completely unnatural to what you're used to seeing, but it doesn't sound like you're explaining something that, and that if, if you were stood next to a truck or a house and explaining being there, it feels like it was a completely like, lucid experience. Well, we've explained it as being a nuts and bolts type thing before. Mm. It's just that tonight nobody really asked, asked that it didn't come off that way. Yeah. Uh, even John will tell you, you know, this thing was, was solid and it was beautiful. And I've explained it the same way. Mm -hmm. If anybody watched that movie, Jennifer Stein, you know, a, the alien, uh, Travis, the Travis movie, mm -hmm. uh, both of us say that on there. It, uh, it was beautiful, and we said it on other shows too. The one that Steve said was the most accurate so far was that was that uh, paranormal, paranormal, whatever, paranormal now or something like that. Yeah, that yeah. that particular episode, which is an hour and a half long, is probably the most accurate thing that's ever been done. Uh, the movie was just complete nonsense. It just had no accuracy to it at all, really. Uh, it was as accurate to the extent there was a movie about aliens and somebody getting abducted, and that's about it. <laughs> but Mike, but it, it was nuts and bolts to, to us that's the way we all saw it it was factual this, this question is quite fitting with what we're talking about right now do you, do you know who Bob Lazar is yes so he, he came out what was it in the 1980s with yeah, he, this he, cop, he copied my design <laughs> he, he copied your design well my, my particular drawing was was out long before he came out with that and what he came out with looks almost exactly like like what i drew mike That's you're gonna have to mine. send me a file you're gonna have to send me it now yeah well, i'll send you just about anything you want me to well no if you say if you send that now on my facebook so that i can bring it up on the screen um your, your artwork um, oh right now yeah, yeah, or, or uh, if you could tell Rich or Lee where to find it, because I'm not going to be able to do it while I'm doing the show. But it, yeah, I can't do it right now for several reasons, but uh, 
No worries, that's fine. But where where can we find it so we can bring it up on screen? Well, you can find a lot of a lot of my stuff on on my uh, Facebook page. If you, there, or you can scroll down a ways and find most of it. What isn't you, there? Well, I think it's all there if you if you scroll down far enough. Do you and do you, ma- Facebook, do you mind us looking at that? No. Go and ahead. your Facebook page is your name. Well, it's it's Mike Heston Dash yeah. Rogers, and the reason for that is because I used to have a Facebook a Facebook account that was stolen from me by a hacker. A very clever guy that got me to divulge some stuff that I didn't believe I was divulging at the time. He took my account, and uh, I haven't been able to get it back since. That was several months ago. But whatever's on there, because uh, all of my illustrations are on there. Swimmer. Even even the stuff I did about the Phoenix Lights and uh, uh, stuff I did uh, from uh, Southern England, all that is on there. It's so not tell like, us it's where not... to tell us where to click, Mike. This is beautiful work. I love that. That looks like a photograph. Yeah, well, people said it. In fact, there's a story behind that. <clears throat> I was uh, doing a book signing with Travis and Flagstaff here. Oh, it's been years ago, but uh, I went to a, a, a place in Allegra, a print shop, to, to get a, a blow-up of this painting, okay? Because we were going to do that and another one uh, for this book signing. The book signing was going to take several days, but... Uh, anyway, while I was down there at the counter, a guy walked up to me and he says, Oh, that's... That's right out of the movie. That's a frame out of the movie, Fire in the Sky. And I says, really? I says, <laughs> I says, you know, I told him what we was doing. I was doing it for and everything. He says, you know, I know one of those guys. And I says, really? Who do you know? He says, uh, Mike Rogers. <laughs> I says, you know him? Huh? I said, what kind of a guy is he? He says, oh, he's a cool guy. <laughs> we do all kinds <laughs> of stuff together. <laughs> I didn't know this guy from that's Adam. Unreal. Yeah, but he was, you know, that's what's common about the uh, the picture there. Uh, it's probably one of the most realistic uh, paintings I've done, but uh, uh, several of them are. Yeah. Man, they pretty good, man. That looks better than I uh, remembered. So this is what we're talking about. That's, that's the original painting that I did for the first, uh, that's the first painting I did of this uh, whole series, a series of 10 I did all together. It's got a little bit of an art- uh, a cartoonish look to it, but it was perfect for the cover of the book, the first book. Mm-hmm. Mike, you left out the Gentry Tower. Oh, God. <laughs> well, it would have been directly past this somewhere, but I just <laughs> left it out. I don't know why. <laughs> now, the way you depicted the UFO here, uh, i that is not even close to what they showed in the movie. No, not even close. Was... And like I say, this is car- car- cartoonish because uh, it, the dimensions here are all too small. Travis, mm. my, if you take Travis and say he's the right size, like six feet tall, all the rest of it would have been at least twice that big. The UFO, the beam, and the whole thing. And the beam had a center to it, too. It wasn't just a, a beam like a thing from a spotlight. Mm. It, had a, it had a center to it. You know, it was smaller than, the, than that. Like, uh, it was like a pinpoint light in the center? Well, it was like a line, yeah. Yeah, like a line, yeah. yeah. Wow. But it did explode like that. And I've done, done two paintings of that where the, the light is exploding in front of him. And it lifted him up and threw him back, just like it shows there. And no sound. No sound. Well, that yeah, there was sound there. There was a lot oh, yeah? of sound there, yeah. Oh, what, what kind? I don't know if I well, heard you say you it. Know, I'm sorry. When, when we first looked at it, when I first looked at it, I couldn't hear anything. But as the seconds went by, it started making noise. It became more and more audible. It got to the point to where I was feeling the vibration through my, because I was holding the steering wheel with one hand. And uh, it was vibrating. The other guys explained wow. that as well, that same vibrating feeling. In fact, that was the sound that scared more, us more than anything. But when Travis finally got, got up there and got hit with that beam, it made a, a, it made a sound. It, uh, uh, I don't want to say zap sound because that's mm. cartoonish too, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you can imagine that giving off a sound and then Travis getting hit, and, you know, and... There would be sound with that, and there was sound with it. It's just that it's not in that painting. Yeah. And then, okay. of course, the sound of him hitting the ground, you know, that made a, a sound. <laughs> so there's a lot, it's a lot of sound. Which is, is this another one here, Mike? Yeah, that's a different painting. That's, that, that's the, uh, the one I that's did beautiful. for the cover, the cover mm. of uh, Fire in the Sky. Oh, wow. 
It's the same painting as that first one, but the first one was cartoonish, and this one is, is, is realistic or more realistic. Uh, I was just looking at a picture of the, um, the UFO from the film Fire in the Sky, and that's certainly some uh, uh, creative editing, isn't it, on the film's point of view? Yeah. See, this picture he's showing right now is that I did that. I actually went and took those pictures with the, me holding some of these paintings because some of the people were saying, that's, that's, a pain, that's, a, that's a photograph, that's not real. Mm -hmm. So I took a painting of me holding the photograph, <laughs> or I mean the painting to show that it, it's actually a painting. I prefer yours than having the picture. They should have put that on the front cover. And here, it shows you the difference. See, the uh, movie, the poster that, of the movie was, is actually a, a picture, a photograph mm. that was made for the movie, but it's uh, identical, near identical to the, to the yeah, real Yeah, doing thing. a good reenactment. Yeah. 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 Okay. It was turned so, around. It was, it was going the other direction. That's why the writing is backwards on that poster. Mm-hmm. So you think Bob Lazar copied the sp the sports oh, model just, from just, you? I don't know. <laughs> just something to say. Yeah. You don't, but you don't believe the guy. But Lazar? Yeah, Bob Lazar. I'm, I'm for the most part. I'm saying he's uh, he's BS for the most part. Uh, because there's no government people that agree with him. You know that he even was part of the their doings there. Mm -hmm. I think there'd be more. There were more to say it by now. It would come more to the surface, and that since that's secret, and he knows it's secret, he can he can he can make it a secret, because they're not going to come out with anything, and he knows that. Ali, I have to take off, brother. Yeah, you you go do your show, Rich. What's right. on? Uh, well, a lot. Um, you know what we've been talking about, not here, but uh, you know, is ufology burning to the ground now? You know did you know what Lou did and all well, that stuff. I, I'll tell you this, the skeptics are always going to do their part to make that happen, but they've been doing that for 40, for 50 some years. And that's what I'm going to explain to people. This is just normal ufology stuff. Yeah, so, that's right. We'll get into you a know, lot of Ryan, that. Ryan seconds. Gordon is just one among many right. and there, there'll be more. There'll be more. You take well, off, Rich. Thanks guys. Mike, it was great meeting you. Lee. Good journey. Good to see, good good to see you. I can tell you this though. I know for a fact that UFOs are real. That's something I can say for an absolute certainty. That's a big comment, yeah. Five years, five years before this happened, before, and that was 1970, Travis and I, and in a different vehicle, I was driving in my Dodge Charger at the time, we're headed to Phoenix, it was after dark, had my family in the back seat, my brother and two of my sisters and my wife, and Travis was in the passenger seat, front seat, and we'd not gone very far out of Snowflake, and, and to make it short, we beheld an object that was a sphere, and it was a, a, approximately 100 feet in diameter. It came down out of the clouds very slowly. It got, uh, I don't know, two or 300 feet above the ground, and a light, it, it, a, a light turned on underneath it, like a, like, a, like a beam, but it was wide because it, it hit the ground. When it hit the ground, it was, lit up the ground brighter than daylight in an area uh, uh, about the width of a football field. And the, and the object went slowly back up. It took it quite a while to get back up into the clouds, but when it got up close to the clouds, it was covering an area that was like uh, three or 400 yards in, ac across, a big circular area that wide, lighter than day. <laughs> and yet, yet there was no, no visible uh, lighting fixture that, create, that, that the light was coming from. And uh, there was no sound. And we were going down the highway. This thing went up in the clouds and disappeared. Well, within seconds, I drove underneath the area, right beneath where this object had been, and the and the windshield covered with with mist to where I had to turn the windshield wipers on. Ooh. And it wasn't it wasn't raining or anything. The mist was coming from the from that object, and uh, it was uh, large and it and it uh, it was extremely dramatic. I mean. Uh, we didn't know what to think of it at the time, but that happened five years prior to this. So when this happened, that was the only thing we had had happen uh, in our entire lives prior to this, prior to the event in 1975. Did the craft look similar to what you saw that night with Travis? No, no. Huh? All right. It was well, a sphere. It was a, it was a hundred foot in di approximately a hundred feet in diameter, and it was a sphere. You know, a completely oh, round okay, object. Yeah. 
but it didn't have any uh, any meaningful details. It had details, but it was more or less to do with color and whatnot. Hmm. Amazing. It, I couldn't really see into it, but it was definitely uh, an alien object. It was it was for all intent and purpose a UFO. Mm -hmm. It was for an sure. extraterrestrial vehicle because nothing else that we've ever had in this world could ever do what it did or look like it did. Yeah, back then, mm -hmm. for sure. Go, on, Rich. You, take you care, shoot. Guys. All right. Take care, everybody. All right. He's, he's, bye, see Mike. you later. See you later, Rich. See you later, Rich. Lee. See you later, Rich. Everybody else. I know. Yeah. I know. Go, go, go. I know. <laughs> <laughs> see you. See you. Yeah. Fast. All right. So, <laughs> so, so, Mike. Um, I, 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 I don't. I know you said you're not into ufology, but this go this is quite fitting with uh, what Jennifer's actually asking here because I'm going to ask the same question. You've heard of the Tic Tac? You've heard of the, the you, you've heard of the Tic Tac UFO that everybody's talking oh, about? Oh yeah, sure. I've seen all that on TV. The gimbal. Uh huh. Yeah. This, I'm asking. I'm asking you. This is. This is just answer her question. Yeah. Well, not just answer the question. Ask, I, I, honestly, what do you think? This is the craft that we saw in J that night. I'm not just going to go back to the craft. I'd say go, I go with two, I go with two questions there. Do yeah. you, do, what, what do you think the craft you saw was and then, what do you think the phenomena is? Well, I go about 80 to 90% that it was extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. Steve, Steve is still hung on uh, government. Mm -hmm. And even though I think the Phoenix lights was government origin, uh, I don't. I, I think that what we saw that night was more than likely extraterrestrial. See, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't rule government out because because it's 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 right. such a crazy yeah. story. You can't just rule exactly. things out. But it does seem like an awful lot of hassle to fake yeah. an abduction of somebody in the middle of a forest. Just for for, for I I don't see the benefit of the fraud. If if it's a government fraud, you know, I, do, I don't see the benefit. I of don't it, see right? the benefit of the fraud for the money because you guys are not making any money off it. Only Travis. That's what right. I. That's what I, I can't get my head around. And I, and, and again, Mike, I'm I, I I'm sorry to say this, but I was already, I was ready to set before I had Steve on. I was like, one of them's one of these guys is going to crack. One of these guys is going <laughs> to tell. One of these guys is going to tell me, yeah. It was a hoax. Well, three people have already gone, by the way, and none of them are cracked, and none of them are going to crack. It's just not going to happen. This thing really happened. What we have happened to us actually happened. Mm. And that's what I want. Right. Well, there you got it. It was a real event, and it happened exactly the way I have described it. And of course, Steve thinks it's a little different from that. Like he didn't cry. It has nothing to do with you, <laughs> you know, whether he cried or not. But he thinks that's like everything, you know, like like he thinks it's a hoax because uh, he thinks that I wrote it, that, that I didn't describe him properly. He says this other thing that uh, uh, we didn't draw straws to the to, to which who went first to the to the uh, lie detector test. Well, we did. But the trouble it was. The, oh, the, you did. Yes, we did. But Steve wasn't a part of that. It was after he went in that we took okay. draw straws to see who was going to be next. But but the the lie detector man, uh, Cy Gelson, was the one that decided who was going to be next. So what we drew straws about didn't make a damn bit of difference. That makes but we sense. Did, but we did draw straws. So you and Steve, drew. Steve wasn't but, a part of it because he wasn't there. And would you say that Steve got picked to go in first? And then you guys could draw stars draws afterwards. But you, was Steve actually, like Steve said, he was picked because he was the youngest? Right. Yeah. We, we, I didn't even think to draw straws until until Steve was taken. But they were telling us that he's not going to be back for two hours. Uh, I can't remember who told us that, but I was thinking about this. You know, it's going to be all damn day long. I don't I don't want to wait until this evening sometime to be my lady, my, my part of the test. You know, and we drew straws to kind of like put it in perspective so we know what to do because if I wasn't going to be having to take my test for like five or six hours, I want to go have a restaurant meal somewhere. I don't want to sit there on a bench all that time, you know, but so that's why we drew straws. But when they came back in, they, 
they uh, I think I can't remember who was next. And uh, they weren't telling us how when we were going who they wanted us all to stay there. So I couldn't go down and get some Mexican food for lunch. <laughs> you know? But that's the, the reason for it. Oh, so, see, another thing Steve said is that his mother was the only one of the mothers that was there. That's not correct. Alan Dallas's mother was there as well. It's just something Steve just hasn't isn't right about. He's he how old was Alan Dallas at the time? At the time, Alan Dallas was I I think he was twenty, either nineteen or twenty. Steve one hundred percent was the youngest there because there was yeah, rumors right, that there yeah. was a, somebody was younger that that had lied. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Steve has told me since then that the John Gallet was only sixteen. Yes, that's what I heard. Yeah, but I don't know if that's correct or not because I never heard that from John, and it didn't seem that way. And John didn't, you know, when when I hired John, he didn't tell me he was sixteen or seventeen or twenty or nothing. He, I asked him, I says, are you, are you old enough? You know, yeah, I mean, that's it was it was it was like that. It wasn't a, a real formal thing. If somebody looked like they were old enough, they were old enough, you know, because if I would have asked Steve for identification, I'd have known he was 17. I wouldn't have put him to work. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that and I suppose a lot of the people that are into this right now is they can't comprehend the 70s. And what it was like back then. I mean, <laughs> you beat the living shit out of one of your. Um, oh yeah, one, yeah, Alan, one of, Alan one of your got, boys. Alan and I got into a fight. Uh, I got, how long it was before that? It was a, it seemed a few days to a couple of weeks before. But Alan had stolen some headers off of my brother's car, and <clears throat> my brother had left his car there in my yard, my backyard, and I was naturally it was my responsibility. Well. The headers ended up messing. I was showing the car to somebody, and, and the headers weren't there. So, and they were special headers, special made. The car was special made. Anyway, I th Alan Dallas was the first thing that came to mind. So Travis Walton and I and my brother Charles got in my van, and we went looking for Alan. <laughs> and we, we didn't take too long until we found him. <clears throat> he was driving in a car with another guy, and we started chasing him. He knew what we were after, so he started ch he started. Uh, it became a car chase. Finally, he gave up and he went to this friend, uh, to, to a friend of his, and he went in the house and he came out with the headers. And I, by this time, I had parked the van and I got out. And I walked up there waiting for him to come out. And he he came out right about that time. He had the headers in his hand. He threw them at me. And of course, I had to step back and they landed at my feet. I got pretty pissed off at that point. <clears throat> so I walked around the headers and I walked right up to Alan and I got in his face and I, I told him, I says, what makes you think you can get away with this? Because the guy he had sold them to was right there looking at him at the time that he'd gone in the house, you know, to get the headers. And so he gave me some line of crap and he, he called me a name and so I smacked him right there hard. <laughs> and he fell back and he came at me again. I kicked him in the, uh, in the middle and he fell back again. I kicked him or hit him several times. He never, he never was able to do anything. Finally, he, he ran across the street yelling shit at me, you know. <laughs> and uh, what's funny about that is that I'm one of these people that I don't take things like that to be really solidly personal, you know. So he came over to my house later that evening. He says, he says I need my job. And I says, okay, I didn't fire you. <laughs> I says, be here tomorrow. We go to work. You know, I mean, my brother got his head, his back. That was taken care of. Alan could take care of whatever his problem he has, you know. But my my argument with him was settled, and that was the end of that. So, so, so after this situation happened, after after the uh, the event, did you ever get into a physical alt altercation with any of the 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 boys? No, Alan was the only one. And that was prior. Yeah, it was prior to the event. Right. Yeah, several days to a couple of weeks prior. So what? why do you think over time your relationships have been up and down? And they haven't they been. This, uh, well, th this is what we're hearing. Everybody's hearing yeah, the fact well, that that's Steve, because, Steve, Steve uh, spoke. Yeah, Steve says that and uh, uh, Dave says that. 
We've had uh, a phone call with Travis with Ryan Gordon, and I don't believe that was manipulated. I have to say, I think that was a okay. That I was a, I, that was heard, a, I haven't heard that myself, but uh, probably wasn't manipulated. That was a, well. It was Travis talking about yourself, yeah. and it, it Ryan was saying you're right about Mike. So, in what respect? And here, well, here's the thing, Mike. It, it was just about you. He he was stating that he had told you many a times to leave Travis alone. Who had? Um, Ryan Gordon. Ryan Gordon. Yeah. He never told me that once. This, Ryan, this Ryan is what Gordon I, this is, is the biggest is what liar I in the world. Yeah, this Ryan is Gordon what is I the biggest clear liar up. ever that I've ever known of. Ryan Gordon doesn't even know what the hell the truth is. What was the project though? What was the it, was it was it a film? Is it is it is is that true? Was he remaking Fire in the Sky? I haven't even heard this. Oh yeah, there, there's supposed to be a uh, Travis has said for a long time that there's a there's going to be a remake of Fire in the Sky. But he won't tell anybody specifically when or how or who. And I've never said anything about it negative. It's just that Travis has never told me about but it. But it wasn't Ryan God mate. You're telling me Ryan wasn't. Oh, oh yeah. It. Well, uh, Travis one time said, uh, no, it wasn't, wasn't Travis. It was Ryan Gordon said that he was the one that was making the film. That's right. And that was on Erica's show. That's where I first heard that. Uh, I, it, it, the, and it that, was bull. It was bullshit. Yeah, Ryan Gordon it, it, didn't have anything to do with Travis's concept of a remake. Like Fire in the Sky, right? For right, whatever, whatever was wrong with it or right with it factually was a big film. And if it's going to be remade, it's going to be remade by a big Hollywood production. I would imagine it's not oh, going to be some filmmaker. So it's and not going to be a filmmaker. No I don't think of. it'll ever be done. No. I don't. I don't believe that it will ever ever come to pass. I I, th I think I imagine it will be at some sometime because everything gets rebooted and yet when you look at how many times the yeah wait, like later the Ros on the, Ros in the Ros future, stories yeah. come out and things yeah I'm I'm sure sometime I'm sure in the future but in the distant future mm. uh, because at at, pre at the present time like you were saying uh, the money they spent on Fire in the Sky and all that that kind of a production. They would have to top that to do it again. Yeah. 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 And why do it again? It mm. needs to be done now, though, to get the full story. Why? Because no, no disrespect, you guys are in your 70s, 60s, you know, like my dad. Yeah, but I'll tell you something. The reason why it's going to be later is because we're still alive. Because the story is not going to be. Yeah. They need a different story. I think, I think your man, Ryan, was. Uh, in love with the idea of the um, of the the tower the yeah. de debunk theory, and I is. think that that was that was what he, clearly in, in my head that's what he was going to do. That's what the film would have been in his mind, and I don't think he got enough meat to flesh. That's the bones that's out. not what Travis is talking about. He's talking mm -hmm. about a remake of Fire in the Sky. Oh yeah, no, no, I, re I, I just meant the uh, Ryan. I think that I think that's what. When he when he talked to Ollie about the film, I think that's what his film was going to be about. Would, would have been a I'll Did anybody this. else mention Gentry Tower? No. Other than Ryan. No. The first time I've ever heard it was from Ryan Gordon. So Philip Class never mentioned it. No, he never did. Nobody. And like I say, there's been many skeptics in between. Michael Shermer, uh, you name it. I mean, uh, shit, they're they're endless. Big names, the, sure. But the location. The location where this happened, the Gentry Tower is nowhere near that. No, four miles to the west and, and not visible from there and not on the same road. You'd have to take a completely different road, completely out of the way. You'd have to go in the wrong direction for like 50 miles in the round trip to go past Gentry Tower, make contact with the, with the highway and go back towards Snowflake to get home. Who's going to go 50 miles out of the way? That trip was only 50 miles in the first place. Well, this is where I ask myself this question. If you you guys would have to be all in on it be, be, because I'm wondering the the other guys in the truck, they would one of them would say, Mike, this is the wrong place. 
<laughs> it's that, ridiculous that, on every count. Just about anything you can say. That yeah. Gentry Tower concept is completely wrong any way you look at it. It's in the so, wrong place. It's it's the wrong time. That's wrong what I'm situation. saying. So, so so over time, I keep asking myself these questions. So Ryan, he, he, he puts up a great argument that these guys could have seen G Gentry Tower. And you know what, Mike? I was all in on that. But then at, over time, I've, I've started to ask myself, especially when I spoke to Steve and I spoke to Steve after the show, why do if if it, because it, let's face it, if this was done, there would have to be some of the boys in the car that are not in on it. You're in on it. Travis's brother's in on it. But if the, these boys, the, the, these these fellas that are in the car, I, I I think they know the land, and one of them would one of them would say, you know what, Mike, you've took the police to the wrong location. <laughs> Absolutely, that's just one of the things that's wrong about the, the concept. Uh, it's on a different road. It's not a road that we ever took. Ever took. It's completely oh. off the track. Unless they were drunk. <laughs> okay. Well, let's just all get drunk and make up anything then, you know? <laughs> I, I normally do. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> is, it, is it true that that day Travis did go missing? That Travis, Travis wasn't at, at work that day? <laughs> no, he was there. He slept for a while in the truck. That's a fact. But, but he worked the rest of the day. He worked before that. He laid down the truck because he wasn't feeling good. And and I knew he was there. I don't know how for how long. I didn't keep track of the time, but he got up after a while and went back to work. You know, the, the day was t 10, 11 hours long anyway. A uh, two-hour nap, he still put in a, more than an eight-hour day. You know? <laughs> yeah, you could say something about Travis taking a nap in the truck. So what? What did that have to do with anything? Because some of the it wasn't, the, are, it wasn't the only time people took a nap in the truck. It happened quite <laughs> regularly. <laughs> Not I on my a, time. I took a nap in the truck on occasion. <laughs> you're the boss. You're allowed. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And uh, what about Steve T Pierce uh, going behind a tree and smoking pot constantly during the day? I certainly wouldn't have put up for that for a second if I'd have known about it. He admitted that to me on 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 the show that I did. A, you know, of, the, of this case, I had him as a, as a guest. And he, he tells me on that show that he was smoking pot, him and John. I tell, well, I had no idea because if, if I'd have known, you wouldn't have been working there. I'd have sent you down the road. You know, right now he's watching this and laughing his ass off. He's doing that laugh. <laughs> yeah, well, good for him. <laughs> just to, to, to answer, because like, there's it, it doesn't really matter what they're saying. It's just the... Um... There's someone in the chat t talking about how how did you know uh, where you were and what uh, how did you know what what where the right place was given the fact it was dark. Um, it would have we, been the wrong place. The Forest yeah. Service would have known because it was all mapped out on a government contract. And if we weren't doing exactly what we were supposed to do, we wouldn't have been where we were. We yeah. wouldn't have been doing what we were doing. That, you know? That's what I, that's what I wanted yeah. to know because it, it, given the fact you were working there, I'm, I take it you were very familiar with the surroundings in the area. That's right. And how did the Forest Service know where this happened without me going and telling them? Mm -hmm. They were the first ones on the scene and they knew exactly where it happened. Yeah. I didn't tell them anything. They were there before the Sheriff Gillespie and everybody. They were <clears> the searchers. You know, everybody knew exactly where we were working because it was all a part of a government contract. Mm -hmm. It was well, all so spelled I, out in black and white. The roads that we were supposed to be using, exactly what we were doing, how we were doing it, it was all laid out. Hell, Phil Class knew all that. He went into that in so depth that he made up all kinds of new theories about how it wasn't real on that basis. But he at least used the facts to base it on. <laughs> mm. Contractual facts. And then was there any damage to your truck? Uh, after I left the scene, yeah. Yeah. What was it? What was the damage? Both, both, both of my mirrors were knocked off. There was a dent in the side of the truck from hitting a tree. I don't know what other damage. I didn't pay attention. I didn't use the truck much after that. 
Uh, how long was the contract for in in that area? Well, I'd have to look at the contract. Uh, it would have it would have, it would have it would have ended within the within the next couple of weeks. That's one mm. thing that Phil Class made a big big issue of is that uh, the, the contract uh, was was too far behind. <clears throat> but I showed him somebody else in the spring. See the contract. I actually defaulted on the contract because I didn't finish it. But I didn't finish it because I couldn't. I, I mean, I didn't finish it because of part of the plan of a hoax or whatever. It's because I, I didn't have a crew. Mm -hmm. I, we couldn't go back. I didn't go back and do any work because I had no workers. Nobody wanted to go back there. None, none of my original workers wanted to go, and nobody knew people wanted wanted to go either. And uh, but the point is that. The contract was re-advertised in the spring, not that winter, in the spring. And somewhere uh, in mid-spring uh, be before summer, uh, it was re-advertised and it was let out to another contractor who actually bid $2 less per acre than I did. And that person finished it in the amount of time that I had left on the contract to begin with. Mm -hmm. In other words, I would have got it done. And this other contractor proved it. But nobody cares about that because uh, believers only believe what they want to believe and skeptics only believe what they want to believe, which is they don't yeah. believe in UFOs. Mm -hmm. So what a lot, of, a lot of... What is that? What happened to that truck? Uh, the, the following winter... Well, it sat in my backyard a long time because I didn't use it anymore. Uh, but the following winter, uh, the engine froze because I didn't didn't keep up keep it up you know uh, i let it apparently let it get too low on antifreeze and uh, the engine froze up and it popped uh, the plugs out you know on the bottom of the engine and that ruined it so uh, i sold it to a, a, a what do you call it a wrecking yard i don't remember what i sold it for if i still oh, had it i could probably get a few thousand out of it <laughs> no i think you get a lot more for that i think yeah, joe rogan yeah. i think joe rogan would Probably buy that truck, yeah. and put, it in his, <laughs> put it on his desk. Yeah, <laughs> but it's probably it's long since gone for sure, and probably, by now it's probably been crushed and become a part of some new car. <laughs> has it um, has it been difficult the, the seeing something which is like a, a life changing, a life changing question that won't be answered? That's probably a good way of putting it. Is that a difficult thing to deal with? I actually believe my life would have been better on the whole. Uh, for one thing, <clears throat> my wife and I got a divorce uh, less than a year later. And things because... like that happen, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of personal things that I don't really want to get into. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, like, like, even like Steve, he says he, his life went to hell after that. My life went to hell after that. Uh, I didn't have any stability for, for several years. And uh, I never got remarried. I took my ex-wife to court, and the judge awarded me the children. He didn't even give, give her visitation. I gave her visitation, but I, it wasn't awarded to her. Um. Uh, and that's neither here nor there as to whose fault it was or who was to gain or anything. It's just the way it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I went into very se several different lines of work. I didn't work in the woods for a while. I went into construction, built a few houses, built one for my sister. Uh, I did some co uh, commercial work, built a pump house and all the technical stuff that needs to go along with it. I, I got into some technical work like that. And I got into sign painting also, and that went quite a ways. I got to where I was doing billboards all the way down to the, to the Mexican border, all over the state of Arizona and even other states. Uh, and I got into eventually into uh, logging contests, you know, logging uh, ventures for uh, You've seen it on TV where they do the various events. And uh, I came out on, you know, first, second, third on all, everything I entered. I won the last one I entered, uh, hands down. I just, I, I took first place in practically all the events. But I'd gotten good at it by that time, you know. Uh, my life just went 
head over heels. I got into for, uh, into the domestic tree service business was the last last uh, line of work I was in, and we did real good in that. I did stuff that other people were not capable of doing, and uh, all along I've uh, illustrated here and there. I've done a lot of illustrating. Uh, I did all the stuff, 10 of them all together for the Walton thing, and uh, since then I've done illustrating of all kinds of stuff. And I've got one unfinished painting. It's a painting of Christ. It's finished, but I just I don't want to call it finished. I don't want to show it until I consider it to be done. I guess that subject is just, I don't consider myself capable of doing justice to that painting. Is that because of what you saw? Well, I've never seen Christ. <laughs> no, no, no. Do you, do you Maybe you did. <laughs> do you think it's a, it's a conflict be, 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 with your beliefs? No, I don't have any conflict with my beliefs. I don't, I don't believe... I believe in a, in a higher being, but I don't believe in it religiously. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in religions. I don't believe in those sorts of organizations. Uh, I'm more realistic than that. But you're doing a painting of Christ. Yeah, a painting that I started over 30 years ago, probably 40 years ago. And uh, I've dabbled at it over the years. I've had times when I worked on it, but so many hours working on that painting that it could have been done a hundred times over by now. <laughs> I just, it needs something and I just don't know what to add to it. It's just that simple. It's not, it's not because there's a big conflict or anything. I think it will come, you know. I, yeah, I think it should. I, I definitely want it to. Uh, I've even Do taken it down and gotten thing, everything ready at times and then just looked at it for several hours and then just put everything away. Might, might be, be, before we end, and I, I would love to get you on again. I'd like to get you on with Steve. I'd like to have, like, see you two just have a chat, you know, as friends. Yeah. Uh, what, what? It always starts out good because I always started out good, but before long, Steve st starts claiming that I, along with Travis, hoaxed him, you know, and when he says that, it loses all, you know, it loses everything. There's, there's no I didn't get that from the interview with Steve. I didn't get, I didn't get that Steve was saying that you hoaxed it. Well, he said that to me on several occasions. So how did you hoax him seeing the UFO take it off in the sky. <laughs> That's what I've tried mm. to tell him. He, how's he it said a hoax, that. Steve? Yeah, how's it a hoax, Steve? He won't answer me. Unless he thinks you were from the government. <laughs> yeah. How, how mm. does how does me being a hoax and with, with somebody else's help, I don't know who, Travis and his brother, uh, how does that fit in with his government concept? Do you think Travis is telling the truth when he 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 said on on many shows that he wishes this had never happened, and he wish he wishes he wished this was one of you, the other six, well, rather I, than him. Oh, I think he's sincere about that. I think he's sincere about what he says happened. All I'm saying is I didn't see it. <laughs> you know? I can't answer that question. That's Travis's story. It's not my story. You know, that's that's his words. I can't vouch for, for what he saw because I wasn't there. I think Steve said that several times. Can't say say what Travis saw because we don't know. We didn't see him abducted and we weren't there when he was abducted or during any of that five days. We weren't anywhere near him. But from what he's told you fellas, from what he's telling the public, his story has not changed I'm talking about on the craft now when he saw the, 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 the beings and he saw the humanoid beings as well. That has not changed. Travis's story has not changed at all in all this time. He's had various theories about it, but he claims that they're theories. They're just ideas or concepts, you know, that of what could be. And he, he makes it certain that, he, that people understand that, but he's not saying that's what happened. He's saying that's what may have happened. 
He only says what's fact in his mind. And has Travis ever said that he thinks it could have been the government, the the humans that took him and put those images into his head? Well, he's told me personally that even though that's a possibility, it seems unlikely because it just doesn't seem possible. Yeah, well, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Steve gets it gets it across by saying it's a, a mental thing. You know. I don't. I don't see that at all. I see both sides. I, I, I see. And do you know what, Mike? I see every side of this. I see the yeah. people side that's saying you, you boys hoax this. I see the side where people are saying, you know, this is the greatest story ever, and that's 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 where I, that's where my heart sits with this. Mm. That's where my heart sits with this, and I see the side that says every single one of you are manipulated because I think that, and you're not in you into ufology, but I do think the community has been manipulated. Well, the government does a lot of stuff like that, but I don't know if they're into mind manipulation. I think their manipulation takes place in the way that I think the Phoenix lights took place. Mm -hmm. It took, uh, created something probably a, a subcontract or some some kind of contract somebody built it and uh, there's no pilot or anything it just flies and it stays forward and it does everything it's supposed to do which is nothing really it just has a point that stays forward and it's just there and it floated with the wind uh, that much i can prove it floated on the wind absolutely absolutely in every detail it floated on the wind elevation speed uh, and exact direction and, but you know that's what happened. That doesn't mean that the government was manipulating people on the ground. It doesn't mean they were getting in their heads like that. They were they were creating that sort of an effect with this object, and then they're recording how people actually reacted to it. They're not manipulating people's minds. Late be before we tune out, because I know my good good friend uh, Mr. G has gone live. I think in the next five minutes. Um, have you got any final questions? Um, no final questions. Just I, I'd like to pull pull something back up that we just talked about before, and it's more more for some of the people in the chat because I, I think I, I think it's been great speaking to you tonight. Um, I always think when it comes to doing these long form podcasts and st stuff that um, it's very difficult for people to hide places if um, if they're lying about things. So I'm. I'm 100% uh, on board with the fact that you're 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 telling the truth as far as you know it. You're right now, and uh, for, for like people in the in the chat saying this is for money and things like that, and I I, I see lots of those comments pop up. Um, when you said just before that uh, you didn't go back working in the forest and you went into construction and stuff, so you're you, you're saying that after this event you basically went back into nine to five work. Well, we didn't go back in the forest. I, no, but I, I did just work in general. Yeah, well, I did go back into the woods mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years later, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't like before at all. It, it wasn't running a crew. Uh, my dad and I I had an idea for a, a, a machine that would do the same work we were doing with chainsaws prior to that. And so he had the money, and we we built this machine, and we did that for uh, several years. Uh, you built, you invented something. Yeah, I invented a machine that would would cut these trees uh, and do the work of ten ten cutters. Wow. With, with, with the with the cost of a, a of a a dozer a tractor dozer a a, a special as a case crawler tractor case four fifty, and we mounted a blade on the front of it that would cut the trees off. And, uh, and then run over the top of them and cut the upper limbs off. And it did such a good job that for several years, the contracts that the Forest Service came out stipulated that it had to be tractor done, it had to be done with a tractor. Mm -hmm. See, you know, and just the point I, was, I wanted to make out to the chat there was that if you, if you were involved in some sort of hoax, which was just to money, to, to make money, um, it didn't seem to work very well because you had to go back to work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. yeah, I don't know where any money is ever supposed to come from. You know, I was only paid a thousand dollars for the movie, even though wow. they used my name and everything. What? I got a thousand dollars for it. Crazy. Travis, I've heard, got over a hundred thousand. I don't know what he got, but definitely not a thousand. Yeah. And there were several people that didn't get anything. Steve didn't get anything. Uh, uh, Dwayne Smith didn't mm -hmm. get anything. Uh, Alan Dallas didn't get anything. Oh, no, Alan Dallas did. Uh, Ken Peterson didn't get paid anything. There are a lot of people that got $1,000 that really don't have a whole lot to do with this. Like my sister Dana that was married to Travis after the, a year later after the event. Uh, I think one of my daughters got $1,000 just because she was one of my daughters and they had my daughters, a couple of my daughters, you know, I had four daughters by that time, but they, they wanted to put two of them in the movie and so they had to pay somebody, so they gave my daughter Dawn, who's the oldest one, they gave her a thousand. And I got all I got was a thousand. However, they made up for it pretty good later on when I was involved in promoting the movie. Hmm. And uh, I told I'm not supposed to say how much, but it was well worth it. Yeah. And they they sent me and Travis Just around the, the world, and they. I said, well, I want I want my sister Dana, Travis's wife, and my girlfriend to go with us, and so they agreed to it. And like for instance, the trip to Australia cost them tens of thousands of dollars, and they paid it like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, we, I know we said we we're going to end the show, but why did you and Travis fall out so many times? Well, because. I believe that he owes me money that he just refuses to pay me, he won't even acknowledge it. Uh, I, I had a, an agreement in writing, okay, I was supposed to get 35% of whatever book, the first book and the second book. Uh, the, con the contract didn't end because of the first book. The second book was the same thing, it was included, and 35%. Uh, and I have all those rights, and I have a right to 35% of, of, of whatever comes from a movie. Travis sold Paramount 100% of rights to the movie. That's where the trouble starts. He broke the agreement, and mm -hmm. I, I could have caused him a lot of trouble at the time, but I didn't because of my sister Dana. I didn't want to hurt my sister. I didn't want to hurt his kids at the time. Family meant more to me than that, but we still had a falling out about it. And it's still a, a problem between us because he won't give in and I won't give in. But we do speak to each other. So, so he still doesn't give you any money? Nope, not at all. Tra Travis, come on, man, sort that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he sold, I don't know how many books he sold over a, a 22, 23 year period up until recently. Finally, to get away from it, he had the book redone with all new illustrations, and he cut all my illustrations out. <laughs> wow. that's, that's a dramatic statement all by itself. Yeah. He's going overboard not to pay me. I think, the, George, George, what's again, is really interested about that. What's, what's really interesting is the fact that there's, there is yet another reason why, if it was a hoax, there's a really good reason for you to come out and say it's a hoax. Yeah, if it was a hoax, you think I'd let it go on like this? Yeah, it, 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 even if it was just like one final sort of fuck you moment, you, you, you've, you've owed me yeah. money for this, so I'm going to set the whole thing on fire. I'll tell you something else. Ryan Gordon is not the only person to ever offer me money to go along with a hoax, okay? Mm -hmm. I was offered a consider a, a, an amount of money that You're would from? make that non-existent, basically, in comparison. Who from? Uh, a New York publisher wanted me to write a book, and uh, they had a concept. And uh, can we name this you, your New York publisher? Yes. You know, there was two New York publishers that published the, the books that we did, that I did the illustrations for, and Travis did the, all the writing. All I ever gave Travis was a few pages to go by for the time he was missing. That's it. He wrote the book, okay? But there, there was a Berkeley Publishing Company, was the first one that published uh, The Walton Experience, and <clears throat> Fire in the Sky was with uh, Marlowe and Sons. 
And I won't say who offered me that money because I didn't do it and I won't do it. But it was one of those two. No, it was different. No, it wasn't either of those. <laughs> so, so, so a New York publisher offered you money. Yeah. How they, much wanted money? Your, they wanted me to write a synopsis first. How much? They pay me a, well, I'm not going to say how much. I can tell you Roughly. how much they were, they were, they were going to write me. They were going to write a synopsis, okay? Uh, they were going to pay me $200,000 for it. Gosh, fuck. And then if they, li- <laughs> if they, if they liked the book, they would, uh, they would pay me a considerable sum. Uh, and when was that? When, when was it? When, about, when, that was about, about? Uh, about two years ago when this case was at its height, uh, when Travis did that sh- Rogan show. Yeah. Right. We attempted. Huh? We attempted. Who attempted? No, were were you, were you tempted in the slightest? Of course, I was tempted. Yeah. But I'm but I'm not going to lie like that. That would ruin my life. Wouldn't make any difference how much money. I, I would have had to have moved out of the country and then ca- uh, looked over my shoulder for the rest of my life. It, it, because it wouldn't be the truth. That's the main thing. It would have been a big lie. I don't care how much money they want to pay. Uh, Ryan Gordon's 25000 is pittance compared to that, but it wouldn't make any difference. It's a lie. Hmm. Just to say it's a hoax is a lie. UFOs are real. And what happened to us is real. There was an object there, as we described. Absolutely. It did everything we said it did. Well, that's a great ending point for this um Okay. This stream, UFOs are real people. That tops it off, doesn't it? We have no idea what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I, 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 honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you tonight. And I, I hope my questions have not come across harsh. It's just that is what the community want me to ask. And that's well, what I want. That's what I wanted yeah. to ask. If well, I, I told you, I, w- I would answer any question you wanted. You did. You did. Yeah. And you did. And mm. you you followed through with that. In fact, my voice is getting a little bit uh, rough here. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yeah, because I've uh, talked so long. We we are we are going to put this to bed, but I would love to get you back on with Steve. I, I'd like to get you all on. I'll be honest with you. Of course, I would. But but I don't know I, if Travis would. I I could be surprised, but I doubt he would. Just tell him we've both got ginger beards. Oh, one other thing is that Steve made this comment that if it, that uh, John wouldn't agree to it or that I wouldn't agree to it. It had to do with John. He's wrong. There's oh, yeah, no, he's no, right. no, he, no, he is wrong. I've already yeah. spoke with Dave, Dave Miller. You there, know. There's nothing going on between John and I. Uh, several years ago, John thought that I insulted his sister, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, Steve is actually my, son, my uh, brother-in-law. I mean, not Steve, it's John. John Gallette. My wife's right. name is Katie Gallette, my ex-wife, Katie Gallette, John's sister. Well, John's you, a great you, guy. You boys have lived a very interesting life. And it's mo- modern day folklore, isn't it? It's not, it's not every day you get to speak to somebody that's part of modern day folklore. And it's... Modern day foreclosure. That's that's kind of strange that you'd call it that. <laughs> no, 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 but that's what it is. You know, it's it's not. I, I don't mean it is uh, to to knock the story or anything like that. But that's that that's what the that's what UFOs are, isn't it? You know, it's the yeah. yeah in that it, in that in that context, then it is the yeah. same. Yeah, it's the uh, it, it's it's part of the like the, the 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 whole fire in the sky story is part of the fabric of this culture, isn't it? It's, yeah, sure is. It's it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I don't, I don't want it to end. But people, this has been Mike Rogers' interview on Alien Addict. That has been Lee Musty Audio. Go check him out; he's in the description below. And Goofon, who decided to dish out early because he's got a live show right now. I think it's actually live now. It's been a pleasure, Mike. I want to thank well, you so much for coming on. I've enjoyed it too, and I enjoyed the questions. And I, I think it, it, uh, I think most everything that I needed to say, I've been able to say. So, 
I hope you'll stick around for 10 minutes afterwards. Speak okay. with me and, with yeah, I me and Lee. That. I got to go. Pete. Um, I got to go uh, to Lee. But <laughs> after that. Yeah, no Pete, Pete, Lee, whatever you want to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Mike Rogers. All right. Well, it's been thank a pleasure. Thank you, guys. You bet. Me too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Boys and girls, ladies and gents, uh, it's been a great evening. Uh, I hope I have put the questions out there that you wanted me to ask. Um, if not, we'll get we'll get we'll, we're going to get Mike and we'll get Steve on together. I'd like to get Travis in the same room. Travis, both me and Leah Gingers. Um, you may not be able to tell this right now, but. There is a ginger beard popping up through there. And if you, if Lee, if you just hold your head up high, you get that shine on there. It's beautiful. I, I think people can see I'm ginger, Ali. I don't need and to point it out. And gingers stick together. Also, gingers are inter aliens because we, it's, it's quite possible that we are mm. aliens. But um, I'm going to go. Like, share, and subscribe, people. If you want to become a patron, you can support the channel. Uh, there are pictures of Lee naked on the Patreon page. Um, Look, if the fucking demand's there, the only fans will be there. That's it. Yeah. You can support the channel further if you want to get some, some, some merchandise. I do design all my own stuff. You can see Bob Lazar Jer and Jeremy rocking an Alien Addict t-shirt there. Uh, there you go, people. You can go help yourselves. Well, don't help yourselves. It's not free. Nothing's free in this world. Good night. God bless people. Mind the bugs don't bite. I'm alien. I don't like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz. And let's carry on this. Like this video to carry on. And get the full, the full, well, the boys that are left on Alien Addict. Just have a chat and just, you know, become friends again. Good night. God bless. Bye-bye.